to talk about a lot of things with you. <laughs> and we're I'm recording on Zoom as well because this will become a podcast. But you were, I mean, the thing is that my, my podcast is basically about journalists and about mm -hmm. um, people in the media. And what I'm impressed about with, I'm just fixing my um, my YouTube stuff, my uh, Facebook stuff. What I'm impressed about with is um, that you went from being a journalist to being a writer. And I just finished your book, your Christmas book. And what is the name uh -huh. of your book, actually? It's, wait, of course, you know, I have it next to me. Good, it's good. always, never far. Love, always Christmas. Kind of like how you'd sign a letter, love, always Christmas. Right. And it is excellent. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now I have to tell, now I have to say that you have to be in the mood to write this kind of, you know, to read this kind of book you have to, cause I'm, I like to read different kinds of stuff, but it's a really a perfect book to read if people want a happy um, Christmas story. And also I, th I find the holidays really rough. So this was a very uplifting story oh, and it's perfectly, you. it's perfectly written, I think. Oh my How? goodness. Well, that, I mean, that is huge praise coming from you, a fellow author and a fellow journalist, because it's such a balance at Christmas. And when you talk about one of the hardest times of year, that's something that I've really taken to heart because I don't think it can just be all sugary, sweet and, and fun. I mean, I read Christmas books and watch the shows to escape reality. I don't want, you know, heartache and doom and gloom, right. but I still want it to be realistic. And, you know, we've all lost somebody and Christmas time is a really hard time of year for that. So I wanted to honor that, but still find the joy and find a way that maybe it could give people some hope when they're reading or some ideas of ways that it doesn't have to be so hard. And, you yeah. know, bring in the humor and the joy. And I think Christmas is just, it's a magical time of year. And, you know, people say those Hallmark movies and, and these books are corny or super sweet. And I'm like, and I'm down for it. Why not? Don't we all need that? But you're right. It, it's, it's very lighthearted. It's romantic comedy. You know, I hope you laughed. I hope you cried. I hope yeah. you had all the, all the feels. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there were some parts of it. I don't want to give everything away, but yeah, there are some parts of it where it was, you know, the person was talking about how hard it is around the holidays. And I could totally relate because basically every year is really rough. And, but there are also a lot of hopeful things, funny things. Um, it has a great ending, which of course I won't give away. And it's got, it's got the typical elements of a story. One of those stories you see on Hallmark or up TV or something, but it's, you know, that's what people are in for. If you want to feel uplifted, especially with the sad things going on in the world. Exactly. So. And, and it's funny when I wrote my first movie, A Christmas Prince, I wrote it because Hallmark, that's where all the Christmas movies were. And I wrote it in that genre, you know, that very uplifting, feel good, clean, family friendly type of a novel. And then that story, A Christmas Prince, ended up going as Netflix's first original when they started you know, going into original content. This was their first original Christmas story. And so, you know, it's fun because I think that you can bring the heart and that's the, the fun as a writer. And you can kind of blend all of those. And I think being a journalist, you know, our background, Margaret, as journalists helps in our writing, right? Everything mm -hmm. that we have is kind of like tools in our, you know, toolbox when we want to tell, even if it's a silly romantic comedy or something fun, we can still bring in that humanity and experiences and make it real. Because I just want people to feel something. I want people to feel the joy. I have people that say that they read my very first debut um, novel was Christmas Camp. And that was also from my first Hallmark movie. I wrote the Hallmark movie first, kind of backwards from what most people. And people say that they read it as a tradition every year, like watching Home Alone or something. And that, you know, as an author, that can't be a bigger compliment, you know, to say it, that's somebody's Christmas tradition. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of weight when I write Christmas. I feel like it's a big responsibility. I'm not going to just phone it in, not that I would on anything that I work on, but I do feel like this is a very uh, magical, spiritual, wherever you're coming from in the world. But the other side of it is it can also be very hard and lonely and challenging. And so you have to find a way to blend all of that and try to connect with people. And hopefully the book, you feel like you have friends and you feel like, okay, for that bit of time, I was taken away somewhere. So it means a lot that you say that. So thank you for taking the time to read it. I know how busy you are. <laughs> yeah. And well, that's what I like about it too, is I don't like to read heavy duty stuff. I don't want to have to think too much when I read fiction for sure. Same. And it, yeah, so it's it's perfect because it's very it's a very quick read because I read it in I think two days or something, and it's really good. But actually, first of all, I'm not a journalist. You're a journalist because I work at a radio station. I work in a news radio station, but I work in audio production, etc. 
No, you're still a journalist. I know that's <laughs> okay. not true. You work in a news station. And first of all, if you're surrounded by journalists, you need a badge there because we're all crazy. So right. if you have to work around them, even in production, but you just doing this, you're always doing interviews. You're always talking to people. You're, you're dealing right. with people. You're telling stories. You are a journalist. So sorry, oh, you. you're, you're in the club, whether you like mm -hmm. it or not. <laughs> okay. But I just want to talk about your journalism career because you were, what's incredible is you covered war and a lot of horrible things for TV. And now you write the opposite. You write really feel good stories. So what was your experience as a media person? You know, there's no coincidence to that. You know, um, I think that just what we talked about where when I was in war zones and I was doing some of the most difficult stories, um, my escape was to watch uplifting feel good movies. I didn't come home from war zones and watch war content. When I was a crime reporter, I wasn't watching the police procedural shows. I the last thing I wanted to watch. I was living that life. I wanted to watch the romantic comedies and things that, you know, took me away from that world, but you know, I always wanted to be a storyteller from the time, you know, I was teeny tiny and I remember my mom and grandma were big readers of novels. And I thought, oh, that'd be fun. But when I was young, I, I was writing stories in school, but I would get A for originality, but I'd get marked down because I would miss a comma or I'd miss punctuation. And I remember I got a C minus once and I was one of those overachievers. I was really upset because I had missed two commas. Now we all know the importance of good punctuation right. when you're a kid. And I said, this is ridiculous. And I also had this kind of, even as a young kid, I kind of, I say I came from nothing and nowhere. You know, it was, it was just my mom and I, my dad wasn't really in the picture when I was growing up and she was a public school teacher, you know, so we struggled, we didn't have a lot. I mean, and so it didn't have any connections or, you know, and no brothers, sisters, you know, only child. And I felt like if I'm going to write these amazing stories that I would go to the library and read to get lost in, I need to go somewhere. I need to do something. And so I decided a journalist was smart because as a TV reporter, I had to say it. But back in the day, we weren't writing content for online, right? We just said it. I'm done. Nobody saw my copy. You know, as long as I said it right, you know, and I did talk slower. I did take the comma pauses. I did. I did that. <laughs> right. And they made me. But that's really what it was. And I really had this like yearning when I think I was 11 or 12. I wrote in my dear diary. Yes, I did that. And saying I wanted to go to third world countries. I wanted to be a war correspondent. I wanted to tell stories of the people that didn't have voices. So I wanted to do that from the time that I was so small. And so, you know, I, I get my way into journalism and, you know, get my first job in Billings, Montana for $9,600 a year. So I graduate with two majors, you know, all of that. And I remember there was thousands of people up for the job. So I was so lucky that I was offered this opportunity. And it was that way. I mean, I didn't make $30,000 until I was 30. I remember a, a boss asked me once, he said, what do you want? And I said, a couch, because <laughs> I was 29 years old and I didn't have a couch. Plus I was moving every year. I lived in 12 states. So Montana, Idaho, Minnesota, I mean, I could go on. You know, as a TV journalist, you move up, you start in small markets, but I was seeing the world. I was seeing people. I was learning about different cultures. You know, when I was in uh, Rapid City, South Dakota, I went to the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, one of the poorest Indian reservations in the country. And, you know, everywhere I went, when I'm in, in Arizona and Texas, I would go down and do a lot of the stories on the Mexican border. So I felt like I was dabbling in it. But to be able to, you know, fast forward to what you're talking about, I finally got to achieve my dream of being a war correspondent when I decided, okay, how am I going to do this? You know, I'm not on network news. How am I going to do it? And I thought it's always about connections. And so I was in Salt Lake City, Utah at the NBC affiliate. And I found out that there was a small unit, you know, of army reservists, you know, we called them the weekend warriors back in the day. And they were being called up to go into Bosnia. And it was when President Clinton said, we're calling in peacekeeping troops. It wasn't called a war. And I remember it was December 19th. It was my birthday. And I thought there's like 18 of these people in good old Salt Lake City. And they were public affairs, meaning they did PR for the army. So they were going to go and they thought we're going to just be in this nice, you know, place. And, you know, this will be good for a journalist. It's safe, you know. And I remember my boss didn't want me to go. Nobody wanted me to go. But I just did all the work, got connected with the army and the folks that were going. And bottom line, like drove, shoot, showed up in Germany, found them, got in transport. I mean, I'm just very tenacious. But all of that said, I mean, I was embedded with that troop for a month. And I got to tell the soldiers stories. So I, back in the day, it was like Private Benjamin for people old enough to know what I'm talking about. The Goldie Hawn movie where I show up, I had sh a lot shorter hair, but down to the underwear, I had to wear all military gear for protection. My photographer and I did. So when we were there, that way we didn't stand out. 
which was much different when I, than when I was in Afghanistan, where it was the opposite. Because there was such a large bounty on a journalist's head, we could not be dressed like um, embedded journalists, like our um, troops, because it caused them too much potential problem. So we had to wear civilian clothes. And that was when I was embedded with an Apache helicopter unit. It was 2017. I was in three different places around Afghanistan. This was, you know, combat areas. Um, you know, that was life changing. And it was the same though, where I was focusing on human stories. But when I was there, there was a bombing at one of the main bases. And I remember I was doing a live shot and I'm standing, meaning I'm standing out there ready to do my little live report. And all of a sudden I remember seeing this wave you know, I, and, and then I heard the boom, but I saw there was like a heat wave, you know, and by the way, this was like, you know, winter. And it was this weird kind of a, I can't even explain, I guess, you know, people will know because it was an explosion. And so there was this wave and then boom. And my photographer was in a building, I'm standing outside the building, he was doing the technical part. So he's doing the satellite and doing all of that so I can be live. So all I know is it comes over the loudspeaker. This is not a drill. This is not a drill you know, mass casualties, you know, da, 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 da. And I just remember thinking, of course, journalists, wait, is this a drill? Like, is this what they say when they do the drills? And all of a sudden it was chaos. Like everyone started running and I'm just like by myself. So of course I follow and I tell people I was in a bunker for an hour and a half during, you know, this alert and the bunker wasn't underground and the bunker wasn't, you know, what I felt was safe the day before it's basically like concrete on the side of the road with sandbags, you know, put up and it's open like an open big pipe so you're kind of like in there like this and you see people walking back and i mean not walking running guns smoke and you know you're just like and i what happened was i was with it turns out i was with a bunch of really really young soldiers and what they started talking about was if i get out of this okay i'm going to take my wife on this trip i am going to take my child to disneyland they were i call them i've talked about this i call them someday trips for some reason everyone started talking about the things they were going to do that they hadn't done, that they had promised themselves that they would do. And I had always used travel as my therapy. I would be in these war zones. I'd cover these really difficult stories. And I'd come home kind of like escaping into what we're talking about, these Hallmark movies. I would go somewhere and I would just disconnect. And I didn't ever have a lot of money, but, you know, you could save up and go to Bali for $600. I remember I took some crazy charter out of L.A. called Garuda Indonesia or something. I just remember... It was some, they came and sprayed us when we we're inside the plane with chemicals. I, to this day, I say, if there's anything crazy about me, it must have been those chemicals. I, well, I don't know what was going on, but it was cheap, which is why I took it, you know, the crazy adventures. But that's when I got out of Afghanistan and I did the documentary and news was changing. You know, the world was changing in the way we covered news. And I felt like, am I really making a difference? Because I wanted to go back in country and do the next story. And my news management at the time said, you're not going anywhere. That was too dangerous. You're going to stay here and cover car chases and crime, you know, like you always do. And I remember I said, if I can't cover the war, then I'm going to go cover spas, you know, like I'm going to go travel and I'm going to do something different. And that's, I quit. I literally didn't think about it. I never thought of quitting. I love my career. I walked out, obviously I'm out of a war zone and probably not 100%, you know, um, but I was so passionate. I wanted to go back and you can tell me that's why I'm talking, you know, just telling the story just like comes out of me. And I remember calling my mom and saying, I just quit. And she's like, your job? Because you don't quit in TV news because it's really hard to get these jobs. I'm like, no, I quit my career. I'm done. And it was just like that. I didn't talk with friends for months and with, about wine, about how I didn't love it. I, I loved it till I didn't. And it was that breaking point where I was told I thought I got to go back. And then somebody, you know, there was new management by the time I got home. And I was told I couldn't go. And I'm like, no. I have something to say. I can make a difference, but I don't feel I can now in this current situation. But I can go cover travel and use travel as therapy. And so I came up with that idea and decided I'm going to do places to go based on what you're going through in life. If you're stressed, go here. If you're healing, go here. If you're trying to connect with your family or someone, go here. And I'm going to do like back in the day, Dr. Phil, Oprah, the Travel Channel, all rolled into one. So I got this idea and I'm like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. How am I going to do this? You know, how do I brand myself from war correspondent to travel girl? And I got to thought, okay, I'll do a book. So I Googled how to do a book treatment. I remember I sent it out over holidays and I got calls over a holiday weekend, loving the concept of travel therapy. So I got an agent, which as you know, is so hard to do. Wow. Like that would never happen. I mean, I tried for so long trying to get agent for fiction and no one had touched me, you know, but this was nonfiction, a little bit different. And I had a different story to tell. 
And so then I started doing travel content, you know, where I, this was before Instagram. I know, hard to believe. This is before there were anything called influencers. You know, we didn't have brand ambassadors. Very few people, you know, it's funny, my travel therapy six, seven years later became very vogue when everyone decided to quit their jobs and travel the world and be on Instagram, right? It's, it's kind of like what I was doing. I'm like, stop it. You know, wait, that's just supposed to be me. But the world changed. And that's a very, very long answer to how the transition. And it was while I was doing my travel show that unfortunately I had to get a surgery and they said I couldn't travel for three weeks and it was right around the holidays. And I don't sit still as you can tell Margaret. And I was like, I got to do something. And I'd always wanted to write a screenplay. I'd always wanted to write something. And I thought, you know, I was feeling pretty down. Um, it, you know, it's, I don't talk about it very often and, but I had, um, skin cancer, which, you know, a lot of people have basic, but mine was aggressive and it happened to be right here. And I had it one here. So when, one of the times I had stitches down the middle part of my, you know, nose taken off and, you know, you're on TV, you're like, this isn't cool. And so what I did is both, I had two surgeries, two different years. And each time I had a surgery and had three weeks is when I wrote one of the movies that came out. So I wrote my first movie, a uh, spec script when I was laid up and couldn't do anything else. And then I'm watching Hallmark and researching, which I tell people to do. And then when I got another, um, unfortunately had another um, cancer that I had to get taken out, I wrote another movie and those are my first two movies. So I, I've kind of, I think the war helped me and the journalist helped me to turn adversity into something positive. I've seen the worst of the worst. And I thought, how can I use any of that that I've learned and maybe inspire and empower and at the end of the day, I got so tired of going to like, you know, the family parties or cocktail parties and the, what do you do? Or what was your story yesterday? And I would tell them some horrific story I'd covered and they're like, yeah, no, no. And now I'm quite popular when I say, I write Christmas stories. Oh, we love those, you know? Yeah. So it was definitely a, a big, a big change, but every single thing I did as a journalist and as still doing travel has led me to where I am now. So it's a long journey, but I, every day I'm grateful for it. There's so many hard days still, don't get me wrong, but I'm very grateful. Well, how do you have the energy to do all this stuff? Have you always <laughs> been energetic? Early. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. My mom, I have to tell the story. My mom loves to tell it's out there in the world. Um, she said, cause some people think, is this just you because you're on? Do you drink coffee? I don't do drugs and I don't drink caffeine. I gave up caffeine about 20 years ago. It never really did anything for me, but apparently I was born this way as Lady Gaga would say. But my mom said when I was like two, two or three years old, I forget, she was at the grocery store and I'm in the little cart, apparently chatting away. And a lady in the checkout line turned to her and said, does she ever stop talking? And my mom, who's pretty quiet, said only in her sleep. And it's, <laughs> that's, that's the story. So my mom said, I started talking full sentences. I started walking at seven months. I started talking full sentences. It's, she has this baby book. That's a sentences I saw for the first time. And it was hilarious. It was like, you know, are you kidding me? Was one of the first things I said, not mama, dada, are you kidding me? I, which I think I'm going to bring funny. that back. I know. So I just think that, I don't know the energy it's, it's legit. It's real, but there, ear, there are gears where I'm either this, which is my natural way of being, but when I'm, or I'm a one. So I say I'm a one or 10. I haven't learned that middle gear. You right. know, um, I don't meditate. I don't, I should, I'm trying, like, I'm listening to the daily calm at, you know, that app, you know, I'm like, okay. And I'm like, Jay Shetty has the, this little um, kind of little bit of wisdom, which is perfect for me because it's on this app and it's like seven minutes. So it's just good for my attention span, right. but that's what right. I do. I get up early. I try to take a walk and then I just dig in and put that energy on the page, whether it's a novel, whether it's, you know, a movie, audio projects that I've just started. I just try to harness it because God gave me this for some reason, besides right. talking nonstop. I'd like to try to tell stories that are going to help people and, and bring some joy. That is truly my goal. It sounds corny, but it's the truth. <laughs> no, but that's what your book is like. But you just skipped over a lot of details because I asked you how you got into writing um, these Christmas stories. But oh, well, I don't yeah, even know where true. you worked. I mean, okay, so where did you? Okay, so you're from the West Coast, right? Yes, yes. Okay, and have you ever worked in Illinois? I mean, I'm in. Oh Illinois. yeah. Oh, this will be fun. Oh goody, I get to yeah. tell the details. I mean, what is your what is your journey? Your media yes. journey? Yes. Well, my so it's fun. I was mentioning when I was little, I kind of decided this is what I wanted to do. So I think I was 12 when I started researching colleges, and it was I'm old, so it's back in the day where I'd have things like on the wall and decide where to go. Now again, remember don't have any money, you know, so this is going to be challenging. I was a good student, but I decided I wanted to go to Cal State Fullerton. I was in Washington, north of Seattle, 
And I said, I want to go to this school. And while it was very affordable, if you lived in California, because it's a state school and they have state funded, it's, you know, very affordable. If you're out of state, it was like, tw- I remember it, it was like $28,000. I think it was more than my mom made as a public school teacher, you know, or cl- in, in that range, you know, it was, it was a lot. And so there's no way I could go out of state tuition, but I was determined to go to this school. So I went to my school counselor and said, junior year, how do I do this? So there's only two ways. You either graduate here in Washington and you go to LA and you waitress or do something for a year to get residency. And so you defer, then you get into college or you find a way to go your senior year of high school. So you are a resident and when you apply for college and I'm like that one. I didn't want to wait. I have no way. I, you can tell from talking to me 10 minutes, that's not happening. So I found a family with his help. He actually knew somebody that was a family member, was, you know, and they needed a nanny. They had two young boys and they were supposed to just be more of a tutor because their kids weren't, you know, really ambitious. Let's just say that's what I was told. So they thought if they were around me and my energy, they'd pick right. some of it up. They were little, like eight and 10 years old. And I it was in Calabasas, California. So when I tell people I graduate Calabasas High School, nobody knew it back then. Now people know, oh, Justin right. Bieber, you know, or they know people, Kardashians or whoever lives there now. But I always say I graduated Calabasas High School, but I was a nanny. <laughs> you know, I, I did not drive one of the Merce- many Mercedes that, you know, were at the school. But because of that, I, I did exactly what I said. I had the goal. I left home at 17. And again, only child, didn't really have anybody, didn't know anybody in California or really anywhere. And I did that. And then I went four years to Cal State Fullerton and I did a double major in communications, broadcast journalism for the reporting. And because I wanted to do this third world country and and, kind of get out and tell more cultural stories, I did a second major in sociology. All of my counterparts were doing poli sci. You know, that's kind of what you do, but I didn't want to have anything to do with politics. I was trying to get away from all that stuff. Oh gosh, especially now, you know, and I'm like, no. So then I got my first job in Billings, Montana, and it took me a year. I, after I graduated, I tried. You send out resume tapes back in the day. Literally, you know, it was impossible to get jobs. People were you know, on-air reporter, on-air anchor, trying to get in the small, break into the small markets. So I moved back home and worked in a little mom and pop grocery store and was the cashier. And my, it was my mom's um, boyfriend at the time, long time, you know, partner, boyfriend, he owned it and they never could find anyone to work. And it. it was just in a teeny town out in the middle of nowhere. And so I ran the store, you know, there's, I was the only one in this, it was like a little, I'm trying to think of what it would be just really, really a little mom and pop. And I, every day sent resumes, you know, every day, you know, I'd go home and I'd, you know, try to research and I was going to get that job. So I got my first job in Billings, Montana, but it only lasted six months. Because it turned out the company at the time, let's just say my communications law class came in good. I I was calling in six months into my first TV job. I was calling my instructor who was a lawyer in my communications law class to go, I don't think this is right. And he's like, it is not. Oh, wait, by the way. Get out of here. Sorry. Uh, By by the way, um, Adam Wade, who's been on this live stream and my podcast, we both know, he said, so great. You both rock several exclamation points. Whenever oh people make gosh. comments, I just interrupt the person I'm talking to. Yeah. No, I love that. Oh my and god. And unfortunately, Adam. um, Sharon, uh, Karen, this is not for some reason the live stream's not working through my own Twitter at Metrolingua. So if you oh. want to share, yeah. So if you're on Twitter right now, is if your Twitter's open, um, you can, you know, I don't know how to do that. Name. I was like, Oh, are you on Twitter? You do- I am. Oh, it's funny you don't know how to do that because your book has so much about social media in it, but. I know. Well, that was hashtags. I got the hashtags, girl. <laughs> right, right. Okay. Yeah. But so, okay. To... If you, well, if you go to Radio Girl um, Pod on Twitter, I'm live streaming right now. You can see it and then you can share that link. So. Oh, wait. So let me. Radio oh, I can just, I, oh, you mean I can share. Let me do that. Hi, guys. I, yeah. I didn't even know that we could do this. So let me just go to Twitter. Yeah. Excuse me if I get really close to the camera here while I do that. And then go to Radio just, Girl Pod and then just re, retweet that. Yeah, and retweet my other, it. yeah, my other stream is, is really frustrating. My other thing is not working on my, I this is the first time it's happens. not worked on all my platforms. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Let's see. Where are you? Radio, okay. Radio Girl Pod. Yeah. And I then go that. to is my profile. One, is it all one word? Radio yes. Word? Yes. There we go. At Radio Girl Pod. There and this you is go. Also I see for, a girl. Yeah, this is all for the people listening who are. Oh watching. my gosh, there we are. Yeah, so you it's can so um, just retweet it. But anyway, yeah. So if anybody's watching this, I'm on Twitter with two handles. One is my business, it's at Retrolingo, which is language related. And then one is at Radio Girl Pod, which is for my podcast. 
And I'm on Twitter at Karen Shaler, which is okay, really easy. Shaler. So you okay. know what, Danielle from our first Friday's Jim Arnoff class had asked me how she could watch. And I thought it was just, I mean, when you said live stream, I should have paid a little more attention. I thought, oh, you know, it's, it's posted later. So I didn't know anyone could watch. No, live now. stream means live. So they can also go yeah. to Facebook. <laughs> um, that's where maybe Adam's watching. And on Facebook at Radio Girl Podcast, it's live streaming right now. Oh my goodness. I love yeah. this. Okay. Well, that's mo- so super fun that everybody's yeah, so Facebook radio girl podcast. But the thing is that when I first started this, I wasn't really that open about doing it because I still had to work out the kinks. Like, so for instance, I can't even, it's, it's not live streaming to Metrolingua. I don't know why, but anyway, I would have shared, shared it to everybody, you know, but I'll share if there's, do you put out a, a video afterwards? Yes. Yes. Awesome. But yeah, you can, um, you can also share the here I'll put here, like, I'm going to put in the zoom in the zoom chat right now. Okay. okay. This is the, um, Facebook live stream right now. So you can share that with your Facebook. Now, how do I, so or you I can just, just click okay. on the link or go to, go to Facebook. Okay. okay. And go to radio this girl podcast. Fun. Anyone watching it. you're all learning about how to do this. Okay. Right. So let so me go to go. radio girl pad- podcast on Facebook okay. and then radio share radio. the link to this live stream with your people. Okay. I'm doing it. Radio, radio girl podcast on uh, Facebook. And then for the people watching, it is, um, facebook.com slash radio girl podcast. And there we are there. Yeah. I'm doing this right here now. I'm, I can like it, but well, you, can do- like it. you can, you can share, you, you can share the, um, can you share the link? The only thing is though, is I can hear myself. So that's Right. But you can um, click, click, share, um, click, share below it and then share to your page. Okay. Let me do this. It says I'm making it, it came up wide. So I see where it says live. I'm just trying to see how to share. Oh, there we go. Share and then then share share to your own page. Yeah. Share now public share to your story. That would be a long story. Let's see. I think you just share it to your, um, profile in your page. So. I think it worked. Let's go see. Let's go. Okay. Uh, well, this will be a surprise to anyone. Oh, there I am. Yeah, good. Okay, good. Okay. This is so much fun. Awesome. <laughs> It'll be so surprised. And then I muted that. that. That's a good tip though. If whoever you have do that, because I was hearing reverb, right? right, from right. It, so I muted that one. So while it's yeah. going, yep, yep. That's all we need is Karen on repeat. Oh my <laughs> right. goodness. Oh my goodness. But yes. So, so that did okay, I answer, so, so did basically, I answer so you, it now? Well, no, not yet, because you're not talking about your professional <laughs> journey. So what happens, you're from the West. Well, first of all, what is um, Washington State like? Oh, my gosh, it's amazing. So, but but I did leave at 17, and I've never returned because I can't stand rain and traffic. And it's two things okay. that, although Washington's changed. I mean, it used to rain a lot, and I'm, global warming is a thing. At least I believe it is, because all of a sudden, my family and friends had to get air conditioning. You okay. know, that wasn't usually a thing that we had to do in Washington. You know, we had the low, mild 70s or what have you. But right. I left when I was so young. You know, I was only 17. And then when I moved to L.A., and like I said, I worked my way up in the small market. So I was in Montana, Idaho, Minnesota, South Dakota, Utah, Texas, Boston, Mass., Texas, Arizona. And that's when I got out of news. Okay. Wait, wait. And wait, I was wait, a White wait. House correspondent briefly. Um, uh, at the white house, when Lou Dobbs was at CNN, they called and asked me to fill in for somebody. And so I think I was in DC six weeks covering, you know, all around Washington, DC, kind of like the white house type of stories. So that was something, let me tell you, but I was covering like kind of the story of the night, like bigger issues, not this Senator versus this Senator. It was more like invasive species. There's a new bill, you know what I mean? And illegal immigration. And I was covering smuggling and because I did a lot of that in my crime reporting, kind of that, um, you know, those type of humanitarian issues is what I specialized in. So see, that you, was interesting. Before I interrupted you, cause I want to get more into this before I interrupted yeah. you though. Um, you were talking about you're working in this store, you're running the store. And then some guy told you you should get out of it. Well, no, I mean, I, I, thought I should get out of it. No, what I was saying is after I was working in the little grocery store and I got, then I got my first job in Billings, Montana, my TV job. So I get in the car in Washington state, drive to Montana. You know, I'm all excited for my $9,600 a year job. I finally have broken in. I'm going to be a reporter. And everything about that was wonky. There was no real news. There was the public affairs show and they were going to have me host that. And there was going to be news coming, but long and short, there was a lot of things going on. I was right out of college. I covered, you know, 
crime and I mean, I'm pretty legally in tune and there were just some things that didn't seem right. So I called my college professor that, you know, I just graduated not that long ago and said, Hey, I'm concerned about these issues at this TV station. He's like, yeah, you have a good, a right to be concerned. You know, um, I would leave. So I did. So then I moved back home again, right back to Washington where it took me another seven or eight months to keep looking until I got my next job. But during that time, because I was so disenchanted, I finally got my job in my dream, you know, what I'd worked since I was 12 years old to do. And then all of these shenanigans happened. And so I decided there was an application for the CIA. They were interviewing people for the CIA. And I thought, you know, and it was, I won't go into all, I can't go into too much, but let's just say that I was a good fit. And so I went through the process of applying to be a CIA operative, which otherwise known as a spy. And so I, you go through this huge long process and I kind of remember one of the lines was, well, you can report for a TV station or you can report for the government and help us get information. And a lot of what they were doing is putting reporters or people that were writers in different places around the world. That was their full-time job. That's your cover. But then on the side, you're doing your other work. And I really was, I was all in. I want, remember, I wanted to travel. I wanted to be a foreign war correspondent. I wanted to learn anything. And you get to learn another language, you know? I mean, I'm like, this is like, I'm good. I'd rather report and, and do something that made a difference. That was always my calling to make a difference. And it was right where, you know, the kind of getting to the final of the program. And all of a sudden it shifted the part of the world that they wanted to send me to, which like, I can't say, but you could kind of figure out back in the day. Uh, the shift changed from more, you know, Eastern Europe type places to Middle Eastern type places where the canoe concern was, and I would not fit and women in general would not be able to blend as easily as I could have in Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. you know, so I didn't get that opportunity to be in the CIA, but I always wanted to, but what was interesting, I did it as well thinking, well, I'm never going to make it through, but I'm going to learn about the process. And I might put that in a book someday, or, you know, everything to me is like material, I'm like bring it on. And it was interesting. And, you know, this is not, none of this is proprietary you know, information. This is out there of a million people that have done similar things you know, to myself on this. But when they say they do a background check on you, they're not kidding. Like they go back to your first grade teacher. I mean, they, they go way back, you know, because it's all these mental evaluations, psychological, they're checking everybody. So if you have any dirty laundry and you're thinking of joining the CIA, I would just say, don't bother because they're going to find it there. You know, you so just, I'm just, that's my little tip for anyone watching tonight that's thinking that, but I learned a lot. And then ironically, fast forward as I, you know, went into my career and did get a job in TV news because I was so gung ho, as you were saying, I would get the first story of the night. You know, it used to say when it bleeds, it leads. So usually the first story of the night, that's the one it's competitive. Whoever starts is the lead story, right? That's the big deal. But it's almost always the worst story the terrible shooting, the terrible fire, you know, it's the crime, it's, you know, the worst leads. And so that's how I got pegged. You know, I wanted to do these humanitarian, I think I would have been really good as a morning talk show host, where I was still doing news and, and trying to do things like give back, you know, like an Ellen or an Oprah, I'm not comparing myself, but you know, that type of content that was feel good, I want to give away a car. But mm -hmm. no, I'm standing on the sidelines in all of these places I'm moving up. And I'm always a crime reporter. And I'm always investigative, I'm always undercover, but I'm doing the worst stories. And I worked with the CIA and I worked with the FBI and I worked with Interpol and I worked with, you know, I would go undercover on drug raids. I spent time in um, Texas on death row interviewing, you know, death row inmates. What a funny story when you talk about that transition, I remember telling my mom. So, you know, I'm single and I had just spent time on death row doing, you know, there just so much <laughs> going on there. And one of the inmates, had sent me something when I got back and it was a Christmas card. And when I opened it, it was a tooth and it said all that I have to give you. I wanted to give you a piece, something like I want to give you a piece of myself, all that I have to give you. This guy was a murderer, a serial killer. And I'm just like, and so of course, you know, I tell my boss who calls the, you know, warden and you know, all of this, how he got it out because they're not allowed to do that. Of course. But he did, you know, type of thing. But I remember telling my mom and she's like, 
Do you have to be a crime reporter? Can't you cover the medical beat and meet a nice doctor? Do you have to have serial killers sending you gifts in the mail? Yeah, there we go. So is it any surprise that after this very long journey, it seemed to escalate? Our world seemed to get more messed up, or at least I got better at finding the stories that were even more messed up. So every day, you know, you're, you're bringing that in. And I liken it to um, if you were a detective or you're an EMT and God bless you, everybody out there, you know, people that work on the front lines and soldiers, they, how do you do it? How do you see that every day? How do you do it? And, you know, as a crime reporter or any of those stories, I'm right there with them. You know, um, maybe my fingers aren't in the hands of people, you know, who are passing away, but I'm the one that has to knock on the door after it and say, I'm sorry, so-and-so or so-and-so you've lost, but may I come in and talk to you? I'm going to do the story for the news. You know, and I had to still do the door knock, you know, and they always sent me, always sent me. I mean, you, there were other named, reporters. But you named a lot of states. What what stations? How many stations did you work at? What stations? Okay, we have to do it in order because I get them mixed up. So we got okay. Montana. So you you count. You're counting for me. Montana, Idaho, Minnesota, South Dakota, Utah. What happened if Utah? Utah, um, Montana, Idaho, Minnesota, South Dakota, Utah, Texas. Massachusetts, Texas, and Arizona. So nine states. Wow. And I and I kind of count California because I worked at an independent TV station in California. And that wasn't my, you know, my home base was Washington. So really 10, 10 states. And were they they were all local stations? All local stations. And then when I was in um at NBC, you know, I, I moved up each time I was getting, you know, moving up the food chain. Like I lived in Twin Falls, Idaho. Billings, Montana, Alexandria, Minnesota, for any, I love it if anyone's watching, which was funny because I kind of was told I'm working at like, you know, this top station called KSTP, which is in Minneapolis. So this is a big market, right? You know, I'm like, woohoo. But I was actually in the bureau, <laughs> you know, the little baby bureau. I was working for the big TV station, but I would do these cutaways that were like, I'd anchor them, write them, produce them. And these little cutaways that were nine minutes for the people in the other, the outer areas of the Twin Cities that they would see me as their anchor, you know? So I always thought, oh, I almost, you know, was at the big time. But my big break was when, after I got out of Bosnia, when I was in Utah, which was still a pretty, you know, big size When you were in market. Bosnia, who were you reporting for? It was an NBC station, KSL in Salt Lake City, Utah. And I was the first female crime reporter in Salt Lake City too. That was challenging. You know, that, that whole, yeah, I love, I love all the places I've been for different reasons. And I was a skier and I worked the night shift. So I'd love to go ski like a half day and then work the two to 11 PM, you know, the five, six and you know, 10 o'clock news is, you know, what we do, but being a crime reporter in Salt Lake city was like a whole nother level of, Oh, I think my light just went out. There. That, <laughs> that was like, hold on, <laughs> hold on, hold on. It's, it's live shows, but my, right. my light never goes out. It's actually plugged, but let's see what I did today. It's plugged in. What, what is not plugged in today? Oh, that's so sad. Um, Oh, it's back. Mm. See? Can you see my little funny pants? Because, you know, normally you can only see the top because no, they're, they're like Santa pants. Yeah, they're, like comfy, they're like comfy clothes. But yeah, so Salt Lake City, Utah was, you know, where I was when I went to Bosnia. So, and then I got my big break to go to NBC in Boston. And I was a weekend anchor. Was and how did you get there? Did, did you send a demo tape or what did you have? Oh, every you... time. Are you kidding? Yes. And, and it's kind of funny because Margaret, we talk about in, um, and for those watching that don't know, Margaret and I met because we're both in the Writers Guild of America, very proud members of the union. And they do a thing called First Fridays every Friday. Yeah, we're all Jim needy. Arnoff, yeah, I'm one of those needy like, people. No, you're not needy at all. <laughs> but Jim Arnoff is like a saint because he's done everything. He teaches. He has been an agent. He's been at CAA. You could drop all these names for people in the business, you know, but he's fantastic. And I thought it was going to be like we'd all listen and he would have a topic and coach, but he's so smart. You know, the best people are where you can ask a question, but he'll open it up to the floor because you never know who comes in. Different writers, right? It's so much fun. We had new writers this last Friday and it's only once a month, you know, yeah. and they come in and they all have different, you know, issues or maybe contracts or I'm looking for an agent. And Jim will say, you know, class group, anybody can help. Karen, you were talking about, you went through this. Margaret, can you help with podcasting? Mm -hmm. And so he's kind of the facilitator and he jumps in, you know, too, with his words of wisdom. But that's, you know, that's how we met, you know, which I just think is so organic. And I wished I'd had 
a First Fridays mentor type group my whole life because right. it certainly saved me during the pandemic. That is and for you, sure. And you did give us a shout out in your latest book I that did. I want you to hold up because I don't have a physical copy. I just got the I book. did. Yeah. Well, your physical copy is coming. The elves are a little slow these days, oh, okay. right? <laughs> well, so, yeah, I wanted to read so, it as soon as possible. Yeah. And I have to yeah, give I you a shout out questions. for taking the time to do this live stream, but you read the book in two days, which I yeah. love. So it's called Love Always Christmas. And I did, and I tried to read it in class and I started tearing up because I've had a really rough year and I just wanted to say thanks. And let me see, I would have to, oh yes. Oh my gosh, I found it way better than before. And this is not a setup guys, because I don't do setups or anything. See if I can read it because it's like dark light scene where I can do it. But I was talking, of course, the acknowledgements in a, in a novel is to thank people that have got you there along the journey. And I said, I was talking about um, the lawyers and I said, I couldn't do what I do without my expert legal gladiators, attorney Neville Johnson and Kim Swartz and to the Writers Guild of America East and Jim Arnoff's First Friday's crew. Thank you for continuing to create empowering programming and a positive, safe place to learn and share. It has meant the world to me. And it really has because, you know, as a content creator and just the stories that I told you, as a reporter, I was always out in the field creating content, creating news, you know, not creating, reporting the news. Right. I, I did not create the news. When that started happening, I left the industry, to be clear. Right. Um, but in all seriousness, every day I lived in a live truck. And I would be wherever, if you would be dispatching me, Margaret, you know, you would say, okay, there's a fire, Karen, go there for live at five and six. Okay, now, Karen, we need you to move over here where there's, you know, been a murder or some other horrible story. And I lived in the truck with my photographer or editor, depending on, you know, where we were going and what we were doing. And now when the pandemic happened, I went from being out and meeting people and leaving the TV news world to doing a travel show where I've traveled to 68 countries to being locked down during the pandemic. And it was so hard for so many of us. And I lost a lot of people. I based in Manhattan and family members. I mean, it's just been a lot. So for anyone watching out there, you know, I'm with you and how hard it's been. And I'm still recovering from it. I still feel very isolated. You know, that life is different now. You know, I'm still not up to traveling like I was, you know, because I have other issues that are keeping me, you know, a little bit more settled at the moment, <laughs> as settled as I can ever be. But that's why writing's an escape for me. You know, being able to write this book and to be able to work on the screenplays and this new audio project is really, I write fun, uplifting content, but I think Jim said it best in our class. He said, you know, careful what you pick to write about because you're going to live in that world for a couple of okay. years. And so let's say I picked a, a world of crime because I know it. And they say, write what you know. Well, I don't want to live in that world. I don't want to live in that sadness. So I write the world I want to live in. If, if a little fairy came down and said, Karen, I'll grant you a wish. I'd have Christmas every day. I'd do Groundhog Day for Christmas in a good way. <laughs> yeah, I can see that because after reading your book, I can totally see that it's, it reminds me of those uh, Christmas movies back in the day from like 1940s Christmas mu movies where, you know, there are challenges, but the people are good people. Like every character was such a good person, but the challenges made it interesting. So it wasn't like boring, you know, boring, <sighs> nice people, but we can talk more about that, but back to your TV things. I just want to make sure. So you covered basically crime and you covered, of course, the war eventually, or, you know, some wars. And you didn't really cover um, more happy kind of stories? No. As a matter okay. of fact, it's, look at me. I'm like, no. If I had, I might have stayed in a little bit longer. What happened is in the news business, you get pegged. So okay. I was that lead reporter. So I got the hardest stories. And I remember sometimes I get to fill in because a lot of times you're a, a reporter on the street and an anchor sitting at the desk. The anchors made three times more than the reporters. I like the idea of being without with people, but I wanted money. I needed a couch. We talked if, if you're just joining us, right? I talked about I didn't even have a couch when I was 29 years old. I was like, I need a couch before I turn 30. You know, I was tired of the struggle. And so I said, I want to be that, you know, I want to be that anchor person. And so, you know, you'd apply or you'd try, but I, and they'd let me. And then there were the weekend anchor shows that were like those talk shows that were like two hours and you do cooking segments. I'm like, I want to do it. And they would never let me do it. Why ever. is that? They're like, no, no, Why you're our that? crime girl because I was hard news. Okay. I wasn't the fluff girl. I look like it, but I wasn't the fluff girl. You know, I was the one hard news. No, no, you got to go out. We need you for that. And uh, we're not going to have you stir up cookie batter. And that's why, you know, it's like when I left TV news, the very first thing I said I wanted to do, I wanted to travel when I was creating my travel therapy, you know, concept. And I went to Africa for a month 
because I said I always wanted to volunteer in Africa. I had never been to Africa. I'd never had more than five days off for 20 years because as a TV reporter, you don't get that time off. Is that how long you were in the TV business? Not quite. I like saying 20 because it rounds up and sounds good. I mean, that includes some college and everything, but yeah, almost. Yeah. A lot. Right. I mean, it was a lot. And I, I never went home at Christmas. I I just wrote about that recently. Um, I didn't get to go home because I was the reporter. Someone has to be on. And I always felt that people with families should get to go home and be with their families. And I was single. And so when I went home, I'd always go home New Year's, that New Year's and take my time off. First of all, it was greater. It was good for airfare. It wasn't as crowded. It wasn't as crazy. And so my family to this day, we celebrate usually the first Saturday after Christmas. And it works because, you know, even though I have a very tiny family, if people are doing things, they can do it with their own individual spouses or whoever on Christmas. And then our little mini family can get together after the first of the year or right before the first of the year. So people say you must have had the most amazing Christmases because the way you write your movies and your books, they're magical. And I mean, I definitely was blessed and had, you know, had love and all of that, but I didn't have those Hallmark type Christmases. It's why I wrote them. I mean, it took me a little of self therapy to go when someone asked me that I'm like, well, no, actually it was kind of the opposite. Like I always dreamed of sitting around with a family and, and caroling, going caroling and all those things. I didn't get to do that. I did have the Charlie Brown Christmas tree. It was a rough, it was one rough year and my mom didn't want to go. I think it was right after the divorce. My mom, if she's listening, sorry, oversharing. But I was young. I think I was, you know, six or seven when my parents got divorced and my mom was sad. And I wanted a tree because I've always been Miss Christmas. My birthday's a week before Christmas and decorating the tree is my favorite thing. And she wouldn't go. She was sad. So I went outside and chopped off a branch of a tree with a, I remember with this knife, and brought it in and my mom is just like and I wrapped it with a blanket and put it in the tree stand exactly well guess where I learned it Charlie Brown Christmas tree so yeah that was our Charlie Brown put the ornament on and it literally did fall I mean it was textbook so I think in my mind I was writing these stories way before anyone's actually seen the stories but now when you were doing crime what kind of crime exists in these places because I live in Chicago where crime is like no oh, big yeah. deal. no joke common. really so what kind of what kind of you don't even is- want to know oh my gosh some of this i mean i can't i, I start telling the stories and people are like well let's okay i'll do a, a pretty rated you know not too crazy of one so this is a funny story in salt lake city um there was a prostitution ring that was going on nationally and the stops were las vegas salt lake and i believe la so it was this prostitution triangle And it was always fascinating in Salt Lake City because, you know, it is a, you know, a lot of Mormons live in Salt Lake City. I'm not Mormon, tons of friends that are. Um, And so people just think just like if you're in a place that have a lot of Christians or a lot of Jewish people, like because it has such a, you know, um, spiritual, religious, that it's going to be this happy place. But, you know, everywhere has problems. And what I have found sometimes um, that when you're at a place that, is um, strict, you know, the stricter that when someone goes bad, doesn't matter what religion, I'm not saying Mormons or anything like that, but someone goes really bad, right? Like when they go, they turn, it's not just a simple thing. So the kind of things that I was having, you know, for instance, you know, in Salt Lake were, were crimes that I would never, you know, even imagine, but one that was kind of funny to show you where my mindset was, I was fairly new and I was gonna get to go out and sting. They were going to do a prostitution sting and I was super excited. So they had set up cops, you know, that were going to be the girls and there was going to be this whole sting. And I got permission to do a ride along and to get this whole thing. It's a national type story. I'm like, this is going to be great for my resume tape. Mm-hmm. So I remember I had to get special permission, but because the, um, the police guys that I was going out with, the detective said, well, Karen, but we go early. Are you going to be able to get your photographer? I mean, you know, we have to go at like 2.33. I'm like, oh God, you know, because middle of the night, they hated paying overtime, right? So I go to my boss, I do my whole pitch, why this is so important. And maybe this can go to the network. You know, they always liked it when the local news story could be brought up, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm like, this could be big, you know, and this, we're the only ones that are getting this access. So I did my whole sales things. My photographer said, you know, he'd do it. We wouldn't even take overtime. You know, we were so silly. What what in the world was I thinking? Um, But anyway, so we do it. And it's like the day before, and I'm, you know, I'm calling, like we get the permission to go and I'm calling the police detective getting it all set up. And I actually think it was that day. I think it was like noon and I'm calling him like, okay, where do we meet? You know, at two 30, like, are we going to the station? And 
he's like, well, if you want to come now early, we can do some debrief. I'm like, early? I go, it's noon. You know, uh, I, I can't get my photographer now. He's working the night shift. And he goes, well, we're leaving in an hour and a half for the sting. When he said 2.30, he meant 2.30 p.m., okay. not a.m. And that's what he meant by early. And I'm like, well, what, who does a prostitution sting? He goes, because these are businessmen. Once businessmen go home, they can't leave. They do this on their lunch break. Wow. Right? And that was a turning point where you say, what kind of crimes? I just remember that was like, you know, but the crimes on, on the southern border. I mean, I did a lot with illegal immigration, which is why back in the day when Lou Dobbs was at CNN that I got the call to go and cover illegal immigration and other you know different issues. Wait, so you were working but for a local station and then CNN kind of I was. You. Yeah, because I, I always wanted, I always thought bigger, um, meaning if I'm on the six o'clock news, the lead story, I try to take a national story and localize it because we had to enterprise our own story. So every day you had to come to the table. What, who, what were your contacts? And because I was the lead girl, I had to find what was going to lead that whole newscast that day. That was my kind of, you know, I'd pitch just, you know, that's probably why I'm not afraid of pitching, Margaret, when we talk about, and you know, yeah. pitching to Hollywood. I don't care. I'll send it. If they don't like it, it doesn't hurt my feelings. Yeah. I had to pitch every day. Okay. stories, you know? And so I would pitch a story and then I'd be, okay, you got a photographer, you know, you go, you get this done and, and all of that. But I would try to find like, if it was a national story on water, like water pollution nationwide, there is this shortage. Then I would go call local. Do we have the problem? How is it impacting us here? So we'd come out of national news with this big story and we'd even use like a clip like nationwide and here in Texas, this is how we're being impacted. Well, because I did that with illegal immigration, I'd always take the big story and localize it when I'm living in Texas. Hello, you know, right. I could go down to the border where it was happening. They would always get picked up because you've got people in New York and you got people, you know, LA, not as much, but New York, like the CNNs, like the Lou Dobbs, they wanted the content, you know? And so I did all these stories hoping to get picked up because you hope that if you're on you, they take your story and you're on you maybe you'll get a job you'll get the call you know the call up it's like being in the minor leagues of baseball the farm league and you get the call up to the majors you know that's how i felt about it so i always was also crafty i was always looking for the stories that could be national news right you know um and those are the ones that interested me i always said if johnny shot sally uh, nobody cares i mean of course sorry to johnny and sally's parents and everyone impacted but that's not the story the story i would look at that'd be the lead Johnny shot Sally. That's the lead. Karen Shaler is on the scene to find out while gang violence in this neighborhood is up 300% what's happening. So wow. I would find a point of a, a, a story. If there's a huge fire, that'd be the story, of course, breaking news and what have you. But then it'd be like, why is arson on the rise? Why does it take arson investigators five weeks to do something that would take two days in another city? You know, those are the kind of things I would was, do. Was that typical though of reporters to do that? I don't know. I, I mean, I, it's hard to say. I mean, coming from, I was so in my zone, but I did have bosses that said, kind of like wind her up and let her go. You know, they said I was like a wild horse and they, you know, I'd come into the meeting and they'd go, you're like a wild horse. Sometimes you felt like I had to corral you and that never worked. And because you, I delivered, they let me go. I got to where I didn't have to go to the meeting, which was awesome because I was impatient. I'd have this story at 7 a.m. I didn't want to sit around and Chit chat and eat donuts till 10 30. I had to be live at five, six, and 10 with new stories. I wanted my photographer and I wanted to go get my story. So I finally kind of, but I earned it over many years. You know, you changed places and people kind of knew. But that's also why I couldn't get on these morning shows. They wouldn't let me. And that's like any job. Everybody watching would know that there's golden handcuffs. You know, you want to do one thing, but you do so well. I bet you even have that, Margaret. I bet there's you do what you do so well, and maybe there's something else you want to do, and they're they're not going to pick you because they you're too valuable doing what you're doing. So mm -hmm. I always say, in my case, I had to just quit cold turkey and say I'm out, peace out. Well, now, what I happened, was like, but what kind of crimes happen in Montana and Idaho? Oh, the same. I mean, I think. Oh my gosh, that's what that's what I think people are. I don't want to say confused about, but you think, oh, in New York, there's going to be so much crime and there's not going to be in these charming little small towns. You know, no, there's, there's crime, there's murders, there's death, there's, you know, stealing cattle, you know, or whatever it might be, but the crimes are still there. You still unfortunately have crimes against children, you know, um, dr drug stings. All you got to do is go to the cops, whether it's the um, money laundering, people doing check washing, you know, people that go to your mailbox and take your checks and, you know, do that. They're everywhere. And they go, a lot of the really bad people go to the small towns to hide. 
right? I mean, it's true. So, because, okay. So I'm in the, cause I'm in a city and, um, you know, some media outlets paint Chicago as this crazy place and that it's much worse than let's say small towns like Mayberry. Mm-hmm. But what you're saying is there is, there are bad oh, things yeah. that happen there. Okay. There are. The only difference is to, to what someone would say is obviously in Chicago, you've got a larger population. So you're going to see more, yeah. but if you did per capita, the crimes, it would be very even there. Are, I'm sure there's still some Mayberries because I write about these fictional places in my stories that right. you can go, you know, but, but seriously, that's what, why the big cities get the bad raps, right? Because they have such a large population. Of course, you're going to have more crime. You have more people, but if you really break it down, you know, sometimes in these little towns, you know, that's where things happen, where people aren't as savvy and a lot of um, scams, you know, people that are scammed might not be a violent crime, but there's like scam artists, you know, because people prey on innocent people and the kinder and the gentler and sweeter the person is, the more they can become a victim. And let me tell a story that's um, because it's really was a life changing story. And because we're right talking about this and about I was talking about how police officers and how do you take that content in every day and not just go insane and be super sad or super depressed or anxious And I never knew I did it where I covered it. I was all in, I covered it and I'd go home and, you know, it would be turned off and then I'd do it again the next day and you can handle it until you can't. Mm -hmm. And a really interesting thing happened. I was actually working on a screenplay slash book idea where I was writing it. I even had a title in all of this because it was loosely based on something that happened to me, which most of my work is. And so what had happened is I've quit TV news, real story, and I'm going to go cover Remember, I had a boss and I said, if I can't go back to Afghanistan, I'm going to go cover spas, you know, very flippantly. But meaning I'm going to do travel, inspiring, empowering stories and that. So I'm actually at one of the top spas, Miraval, which is in Arizona, and it's known around the world. It's this beautiful place and it's holistic and they have all these things. They have, um, you know, wellness. It's just it's phenomenal. And I'm there. And one of the things I shouldn't even have named it because then they'll laugh when they, they hear this story. But. I'm doing this travel story. I have my producer um, at ABC um, out of New York. And so she's with me and she's very zen. She's the one that's going to have the crystals and be chill, completely opposite to me. And I'm me, you know, me. And so I remember they gave me a treatment. There was a healer, a Native American healer. And um, wasn't even quite sure because I was just like, let's go, let's go. I got to do this so I can do a story. And they wanted me to do this. I thought, is it a massage? And they're like, oh, it's a healer. He's world renowned. We definitely want you to meet him. So I'm thinking I'm going in there with a photographer. They said, well, just go talk to him first, but they wanted me to have the experience, which is what, of course you would always do. You know, you need to experience it so you can write about it specifically and travel and all of that. So I go in, not really understanding what's going on and I'll just fast forward to it, but I'm remembering you lay down. So I'm thinking, is this a massage? And he's doing like the stage in the room and chanting. And um, I remember that he had feathers And I wrote this like in my screenplay where I was like, you know, like feathers in my mouth. And all I'm thinking about is what time is it? You know, I got to go like chop, chop, buddy, whatever you're up to, let's go. Um, Terrible. See, I'm making myself look like a horrible person Um, because I'm not that way now. So I can share the truth. So anyway, I'm just like, let's go, let's go, let's go in my head. And all of a sudden he starts talking and he says, he says, um, I, I, they're talking. He's telling me, he goes, I'm hearing the voices. And I'm like, here we go. Um, he's like, I'm hearing the voices. They're speaking with me. Um, they're children. And I'm just, you know, I know it like from any kind of like, and I do believe that, you know, I do believe in this, you know, it's just at that moment I was in my type A type 10 self, but he was like, uh, and I've learned to keep my mouth shut. Cause if I say something, then they could continue using that. You know, like if it's a mind, uh, what do you call a fortune teller or someone like that at the fe- the county fair or something. So I'm not going to say, you know, anything, but he was like, it's children. It's, a- it's definitely children. And I'm thinking to myself, I have no children. So I'm just zipping it, you know? And he's like, can you tell me, you know, do you have children? I said, I do not. And he was seemed very alarmed. Genuinely. He goes, do you, Oh, that seems, well, it seems like you do. He goes, well, are you a school teacher? I'm like, I am not. So he names a few other things that would have children. And I'm like, you know, and he said, well, they're here. They're very clear. And they all are saying, I I cry every time I tell the story, but he goes, they're all saying it's okay. I'm like, and he goes, it's that it's okay. You've done enough that it's okay that you left and it's okay because you helped them. And it's probably the first time I haven't like bald when I say it, but right before I quit TV, 
besides being in Afghanistan, and I don't like covering, you know, talking about gruesome things, but there was a serial rapist, a very horrible story. And I had to go sit in trials of very young children and hear their horrifying stories over and over and with the parents and all of these things. And there were a lot of crimes against children I had done prior. And it just seemed like they just kept happening. And it was just, you know, it is what it was. And the other things that he said that I won't say, because, you know, to protect privacy of people, but it was what he was talking about. It was clear as a bell. It was those children. And they were thanking me that it was okay that I left, meaning I had quit TV news and that I had made a difference and that I had helped them. And that was when I remember sitting up and I just was like, and, and I said, I don't know why I'm crying. I was embarrassed because I was crying there too. I go, I don't know why I'm crying. And he goes, because you have PTSD. And I again had just come out of, you know, Afghanistan. And I was very defensive of that statement. I said, because I knew soldiers with PTSD. I said, I do not have PTSD. The real soldiers have PTSD. I was just a reporter. This, I, you know, no, no, no. And he goes, no, not about the war. And he goes, about your career. And he oh goes, you, he goes, think of it as a curio, like a cabinet with little drawers. He said, every day you would have the saddest story or the horrifying story and you come home and the way you dealt with it, you open the drawer and you put it in and you shut it. And you went the next day and you did another story. He goes, this is how EMTs are. This is how doctors are. This is how trauma specialists are. This is how people that work with veterans are. It's so hard, You but you lock it away. You lock it away. Some people can do their jobs for a year, some for a lifetime. But one day, one story happens just like all the others and you go to put it in the drawer and all the drawers are full. And when you look for it, they all open and they come at you. And it so resonated with me, Margaret. I was like, because when I quit TV, remember how I said, this was a job that I picked when I was 12. I left home at 17 for this career. How did I just quit? There wasn't a huge fight. There wasn't a, I hadn't thought about it. I was just done. And I think that's what happened. There was a moment. And since then, I have not watched a full newscast because it triggers. I just can't watch news. I, I get it other ways, of course, to be educated, but I can't watch a newscast because it literally, like my friends think I'm crazy. They're like, you've been in news, it's who you were. But if I walk in a room and a newscast is on, I'm like, nope, can't do it. Because it all of a sudden, all the drawers are open. All the stories, all those horrifying things of 20 years just hit me really hard. And so I think that story is what I kept with me as you know, such a learning experience. And when I went forward to do travel and doing what I'm doing now, writing novels and everything, I wanna remember the pain and I wanna remember the people and the voices. I blocked them for so many years and there's still a lot I block, I'm sure. Years and years if I had therapy probably would, would say that, you know, but I don't wanna, I, I wrote in one of my stories once and it's, it was, I think my stories are like therapy to me because I learn about myself, but I wrote that when you shut down emotionally, and I was talking about a relationship, but you shut down and you're not going to, you've been hurt by someone and you're not going to let them in because they hurt you. But unfortunately, when you shut down like that, it's not like it's just, I'm just shutting down with my romantic relationship. You shut down with everything. And that's what I learned. Like you can't just compartmentalize. I had shut down. So when I first started writing fiction, I had a really hard time because I didn't want to you have to be vulnerable when you're writing, you know, and you have to really write from your heart or else people are going to read it and be super bored and not connect. I had to kind of open that floodgate that I hadn't wanted to. And I had to be vulnerable and, you know, reviews or if people hate you, you have to be okay. And I think it's why when you see me in Jim Arnoff's class, I'm so passionate about you guys have to go for it. You have to believe in it. You know, you, you have to, you've been given whatever God given talent you are and don't let anyone stop you. You have to go forward. You have to try, you know, you'll never regret trying and, and, and failing, but you will regret never trying and saying, what if I, what if, what if I could have, should have. So I just, I am passionate because I believe that, you know, we only have so much time and we've seen that all of us in different ways. And I don't want to waste it with self doubt. You know, I beat up myself every day too, you guys, you know, I do. I mean, I don't share on my social media the people I've lost. I lost someone very important to me a week ago. I can't even talk about it. You know, I've lost family members. I don't put that on social, not because I want you to think I have a perfect life, but because it's too hard for me. That pain is something I just can't share. I, I'm not able to do that. I love when people do put it out there and I see the love and I feel like they're uplifted. And I have friends that say my Facebook posts that actually helped me, you know, heal. I'm not that evolved to be able to share but I'm hoping in my writing that I can open up some of these things, open up myself. So when you read my story, Margaret, even if it's like my little Christmas story, 
that you're going to feel something. And, yeah, and to that note, this, I just have to share this, this house, I wrote this book is dedicated to somebody, the person that I just lost last week. And she took me, she was in tourism and she took me to this house. It's a real B and B in Fredericton, Canada in New Brunswick. And she took me and we were, I was covering this in travel therapy. And then every time we went back to that area of Canada and did my TV segments, we'd stay in this charming little house that looks like a Hallmark Christmas movie and an inspired Christmas camp. So when I knew what she was battling with a terminal illness, I wanted to dedicate this book to her, not the characters for her privacy, of course, but her, the dedication is in here. And I wanted to use the house that we spent time at together with the permission of Deborah Quartermain. This is the Quartermain bed and breakfast. And so that to me was big. That was a, a big share, even though a lot of people, I do talk about it in the acknowledgements. Um, I don't mention she passed because um, that's still something that's hard. So I just, I just want everyone to know, because we're going into that holiday season, we talked about it earlier, where it can be very triggering. But in Christmas Camp, that's the Hallmark movie I wrote, where I also wrote the book. And it's something that was cut out of the movie. You know, if I met the director and I said, why? There's so many things that, you know. Wait, I saw that movie. That's, a, that's the one I saw, right? That they were rewriting. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I think so. And that yeah. one, that was so much was cut. I love, I tell people, read the book and watch the movie and you'll see how, because I wrote them exactly the same. I wrote both. But there was a scene, and I hope this helps anyone that's listening, because we've been talking about some pretty heavy stuff. I mean, as we go into the holidays, um, I'm never saying pretend that it's okay that you don't miss someone at the holidays. That's not right. You have to feel what you feel. But I also believe it's a time of year where there's so much joy and there's memories that you can have. And so I said in Christmas camp that the stars in the sky represent the people we've loved and lost looking down on us always and that they're always with us. And for me, that brings comfort. For me, that makes me no matter where I am in the world, I can look up and see the stars and I can feel like that they're with me. That helps me. And I had people that came, I, I created a real live Christmas camp after I wrote the book and the movie. Everyone said, well, we wish there was a real one. So I partnered with the Phoenician Hotel in Scottsdale, Arizona, and we created for 10 days all of the things that were in the movie, all the events from, and we added some like cocktail mixology and we did all of these Christmas themes and we did a night where we went outside and we did the s'mores and we, you know, we had our chairs for the people that weren't with us. And we had a, a astronomer bring a telescope so we could honor those and just take a moment in all of the holiday, you know, all of the holiday craziness. So I think that when I write, and this one probably took the most out of me because it was the most, you know, real to me and including some things that, you know, are a little more challenging. But I think that's why hopefully when you connected with the story, that's what I'm hearing from people that that's why they like it because it's real. Yeah. We also say because what you just described, what you went through reminds me of what the main character in your current book is going through. Mm -hmm. And also with Christmas Camp, which I saw because <laughs> I was looking <laughs> for your movies on, on, um, on Comcast and it was the same idea. So yes, I know that it's very uplifting and so forth, but there are elements of truth from what you're just ex describing mm -hmm. about your own life. So well, and I think that at the holidays, it would be very, you know, remiss to we've all lost somebody. And I think the holidays are the hardest time of year, you know, the anniversaries, the birthdays, but there's something about Christmas, you know, Thanksgiving too, maybe for some, but to me, it's always Christmas. My grandma on my dad's side, loved Christmas. And that's one of probably the reasons besides being born a week before Christmas. And I have a, another story I'll tell you that's much more uplifting. That's fun about why I have Christmas in my blood. Literally, literally, I, I'm, I'm like got my Christmas Karen name, you know, very interesting way, the nickname. But all of that said, it's like, you know, we've all lost somebody, you know, at that time of year. And so my grandma, who I love dearly, I was an only child, only grandchild. So we were very close. And she had been battling cancer. And so it got close to Christmas. And she had said, I am not passing away on Christmas. I don't want you to have that memory. And she got really, really sick. And I got the call. We thought she was going to be fine. So I was and one of my big regrets. I know I couldn't have, I wasn't a mind reader or fortune for seer, but I wish I had been there. Um, I was anchoring the news and, you know, across the country in a different state, because again, you know, it's Christmas Eve and I'm working and I'm thinking I'm flying home after Christmas when I work to see her because, you know, she was doing better. But apparently on Christmas Eve, you know, she took a really bad turn and I got the call. And I know that when she passed, it was exactly 1201. This is a true story. It always makes my little self shiver. 
1201 midnight, meaning it was not Christmas. It was now December 26. And my grandpa says the furnace in the house, because she was home with hospice, the furnace in the house went out. It got really cold like the next day. And he realized, oh, he had to have someone come. And the furnace went out at exactly 1201. Wow. And I just, and so I had a choice. I could, for the rest of my life, Christmas Eve could be the worst day of my life and Christmas. But I remembered it. So I said, I remember what she wanted. She didn't want that. So I, I don't get me wrong. It was very hard the first couple of Christmases, but I said, I'm going to have a toast of champagne to my grandma. And my grandma loved decorating with real ribbon. Like, you know, we didn't have a lot, like it could be a pair of socks, but she'd buy that nice ribbon. And then she'd also iron it and use it the next year. We have to all give it back. <laughs> so you'd get, oh, this ribbon from, you know, how many years ago? But I do that to this day. Now it's easy. Thank you, Costco. You can get that ribbon for nine bucks, you know. But all my friends know that when I wrap with real ribbon, it's in honor of my grandma. That's a memory and something that was important to her. So that's what I try to do. That's kind of the way I write in my stories. I try to honor the people that we've lost, but then remember the memories and try to find ways that you can grow and heal, you know, through that while you're also opening your heart to love because it's hard to find love if you're shut down because of other things in your life. You know, not everyone has great Christmas memories, period. You know, then what do you do? You, then you have to start finding ways to create new memories. Right, because that's what I notice. That. Yeah, because that's what I notice in um, Christmas camp. I keep laughing because it's so funny. Because my <laughs> husband are like, what's this? And then, <laughs> oh, you made him watch a homework. Oh, I'm so sorry. We both I'm watched so it, yeah. And that, and also <laughs> your book, your current book. And I thought, you know, yes, sad things can happen, but you can create new memories and you can also create new traditions. You can meet new people, et cetera. Good things happen. So, and I, I think, I do think that you can have bad things happen in your life, but good things can come of it. You just have to be open to it. So I think Absolutely. that's also the message of what you've written, but okay. Thank so back. You. Okay. We'll talk more about this. I, I know I keep saying that, but okay. So you got out of, now I understand why you got out of uh, reporting and yeah. then you started this travel show. And then mm -hmm. where was this travel show? How did you do it? Where was it? Shown? Oh, it was so much fun. I mean, and how did you get the still... agent? How do you get the agent? Um, oh, for the book? The book agent. Yes. The, no, you, that said was, that, you, said, you, you said you got an agent for the show. I know for the book, because first I had to sell the, I knew that to do any content I had to, here I was coming out, I'll, I'll back up a little bit. I was coming out of being a war correspondent. I built my brand of almost 20 years of a certain kind of journalist, you know, hard news. We say hard news journalists. So how in the world am I going to go cover spas and food and pretty hotels? You know, um, I knew I had to disappear and kind of reappear as somebody else, which is in my mind. So I was living at the time in Arizona because I had been here in Boston. I'd been in Washington, D.C. And in my mind, I was trying to have work life balance. It was the one time in my life I really was. I realized all I'm doing is working. You know, I'm not going home at Christmas. I'm missing some major events. And so I thought I need balance. So I had moved to Arizona and I worked at a local TV station, which career wise, some would say market size. Now, I'm not saying it was step down career because you can be happy anywhere and people like it's so hard to get a job in Arizona because they pay you in sunshine, but it's a great place to live. Yeah. And so I came here and I said, I want to work four tens, four, 10 hour day. So I could have Friday, Saturday, Sunday off. I'm going to golf. I'm going to have a life. I'm going to date, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to do it. I had been in Arizona. One of the places I won um, my first Emmy was Arizona and I'd never been. And I remember going to this fabulous hotel and it was like winter and it's 75 degrees and they have the tiki torches and people are sitting outside. And I'm like, I would, this is gorgeous. And it was, you know, Arizona is stunning. You know, it's beautiful Scottsdale, you know, in particular where I had gone. So it was in my head, you know, thinking, oh yeah, this could be, you know, this could be really cool. So when I left, you know, my Afghanistan and said, I'm going to do travel therapy. And the way it happened was, so this is fun. This is the moment travel therapy was born. So I quit TV. I think I'm still in shock. I'm like, well, what am I going to do? I didn't have a lot of money. So I'm like, not like I'd planned for this. I'm going to quit. So I remember I was at the gym, I was taking a 5.30 a.m. spin class and I didn't know anybody. I, you know, I'd just gotten, I'd been gone a month um, in Afghanistan. And so I'm in my spin and I'm one girl, I kind of knew, so it's kind of like, oh, you know, and you're getting ready and, you know, the teacher's about to start. And I complained about something, some dumb thing on the bike I was getting on. I do, I just remember I was complaining. And then I said out loud, what am I complaining about? I have soldiers I've left in a war zone. And I'm whining about some stupid thing. I was so mad at myself. And I said out loud, you know what? I need some therapy. I need some travel therapy. I need to get on a plane. And I literally said the words travel therapy. And I thought, I'm messed up. I'm not myself. I need to go somewhere and heal. I need to go and get my head on right. 
you Wait, know, sorry, how and, long were you, how long were you away from your news reporting business or news reporting career? Well, at this point, this was right after I'd quit, right? So I quit okay. in Afghanistan. Yep. And I don't know what I'm going to do. Okay. And hadn't really, like I said, I was still in this coming out of Afghanistan. It might've been maybe, you know, gosh, I'm trying to even, you know, remember when it was, you know, it's hard to say, cause it was all a blur back then. I remember I, you know, those earpieces that are expensive that you get molded to your yeah. ear. I threw yeah. it away. I remember someone going, you know, you could use that for other things, which by the way, years and years doing stuff like this. And I've been, I've stayed in TV all these years. I could have used that. <laughs> I think it was symbolic. You know, I took it and I walked out and there was the dumpster outside and I just was like, I'm done, you know, and in my mind, what a dumb thing to do <laughs> looking back on it. But yeah, so it hadn't been very long. And that's when I said, you know, I need this travel therapy. And so I started Googling in my head. I, I had this whole thing. My, my brain works as fast as I talk. I thought, Dr. Phil, Oprah, the travel channel, put it into one. I can help people pick the trip based on what you're going through in life. If you're stressed, go here. If you're looking for romance, go here. I could see this website. And again, this was, you know, long, you know, long time ago. And so I could just see it all. And I was just like, you know, this, this would be amazing. But then I thought, I want to sell this book. So I put together this idea for these chapters, different therapy and all of that. I had some, I'd done a little traveling. Remember, it was what I loved. It was my therapy. That's how I got this idea. So, you know, maybe a trip a year. And I had, I love photography. So I had some really pretty pictures. And I thought, hey, I could do this more. This is amazing. Because I knew I wanted to go to Africa and volunteer. Like, as soon as I quit, it was in my mind, I'm going to Africa. I'm going to finally go volunteer. Nobody's stopping me now. You know, I just felt like this, I'm going. Didn't know how, how I was going to pay or anything like that. But I just knew I was going to go. And so I thought, well, I got to sell this book. I got to go to New York. That's where all the publishers are. Mm -hmm. And New York is a really good place if you want to reinvent yourself. Because, you know, I'm this hard news reporter that everybody knows. So I'm like, that's it. So I sold my car. I knew nobody. Nobody in Manhattan, nobody in New York, nobody in the East Coast. My whole family's in Washington. But what was it I, like? Yeah, go ahead. No, sorry. Let's uh, hold on to your thought for a second. But what's it like since you're from the West Coast? What was it like to move to the East Coast? I just want to like, was it weird? Oh, yeah. No, that's culture? a great. Okay. No, that's a great question. Um, yeah. I think because I went in so open minded, you know, and the, the bigger thing, it wasn't the personalities of people. At first, people think New Yorkers are really at this is, you know, the original thing I think my West Coast people would think New Yorkers are cold and they're hard to get to know and all of that. And I found it completely opposite because when you're in New York and in my little neighborhood, I lived on the Upper West Side. And when you're there, it's like a neighborhood. So I knew my little local bar where I ate every day and I knew everybody and everybody was like going to Cheers and the TV show. Everybody knows your name, the doorman. It was friendly. I lived by Central Park. I'd walk in the park. It was peaceful. I had such a great life. I just recently, I, I still, let's say I'm a New Yorker, technically. I just recently gave up my apartment. I kept it during the whole pandemic, thinking I'd go back, thinking I'd go back, thinking I'd go back, you know, because I, I left during the pandemic because where I was living in New York downtown, it would have been really hard. I didn't even have a full-size fridge because I ate downstairs at the restaurant, you know, because I was traveled in my travel show. I, there was nowhere to store food. I mean, it, it was going to be difficult. And then my dad on the um, West Coast was having some health issues. So I wanted to be closer to him. I didn't want to be all the way across the country. So anyway, when all of that happened, you know, I'm, I'm like in New York. You sold and your I'm car. Like, yes, yeah, so you're saying you yeah. sold your car. And yeah, then... sold the car. But, but to your question, to answer your question, the people were great. I still say that because I say it's like layers of clothing. If you meet, go to New York in the winter, sure, you have to peel back the layers that they take off the coats and the sweaters to get to know them. But once you do, they're true blue and they're there for life. Where I found in LA, where I had lived for my senior year and four years of college, was much more superficial, where everyone's like, oh, I love you immediately. Like, I love you, love you, love you, you know, because they're all wearing skimpy little clothes because it's hot. But are they really going to be there for you in a bind? Maybe not so much. That it was more outwardly superficial. This was just my, again, I'm, you know, my initial. Yeah, people said that. I've heard people say it. that. Yeah. But I felt like in New York, it was really this community. And I love LA too. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, you know, that's my other, that's my other home. But I'm just saying outwardly. So I didn't feel that big transition of, oh my gosh, New York is East Coast is so much worse, you know, except the cost, you know, the cost was ridiculous. And that was hard. That's why I sold the car, used it to get a little tiny studio, you know, and pay, you have to pay more than the car that I sold to get in first, last broker's fee. It was ridiculous. And I didn't have any money because I wasn't making much as a reporter before I left. Because remember, I'm in Arizona. I'm not at a network. I'm not in Chicago. I'm not in New York. You know, I'm just in a local market where they paid in sunshine. And so I was like, hmm, that's a good thing about growing up with not a lot. 
you kind of learn to be scrappy. So I wasn't like some one of those millionaire people and all of a sudden I had no money. I never had money. So I didn't have a couch, remember? So it actually works out well for me. I know how to be scrappy. And that kind of started the whole journey. And then I had this idea. And the irony was I fly there to go to New York because I want to sell my travel therapy idea to do a book. And then I wanted to do the show. You know, I had this whole plan. But I didn't mention when I was flying there. So I got out of Afghanistan in 2017. Well, it was 2018, February. And if people that remember the timeline, not only did the Giants win the Super Bowl the day I arrived, um, but that was when the economy crashed. Wait, I didn't so, wait. I do 2018 or 2008? 18. Yep. 18. No, okay. eight. 2008. Yeah, 2008. Sorry, you're okay. right. Oh my goodness, Margaret. Thank you. I'm like 18. I'm like, that was only a few years ago. Yeah. <laughs> I was God. like, whoa, you See? just got out of that? Okay. Yeah. Oh my gosh. No, it was 2008 and it's 2007 in Afghanistan. My brain today, I tell you, but yeah, I'm drinking water and I should be drinking. I should be drinking something else, but no. So it was 2008 and that's when the economy crashed and ABC, everyone will remember the news media. Everyone was hemorrhaging jobs. So all of, you know, I always thought I could freelance if worse comes to worse. I'll get there and freelance, right? But no, everything fell apart. So I cashed in my 401k that you're not supposed to do. I cashed in part of it and said, well, this is for retirement. And this is, I'm reinventing myself. So it's okay. And it was a, it was a struggle. I could tell you the journey. It goes on about how I actually applied to ABC. There was a, a it was online, you know, it was, again, we're 2008. And I, they were looking for like an online writer for a site of travel. I thought, well, that's a way in the door. You know, um, at, for a short amount of time, I worked at Fox News in the basement writing news. Wow. It was Shepard Smith's show, writing news for reporters that I had competed against when I was a reporter. So, you know, as a correspondent, be correspondent, we'd all be lined up reporting at different networks. But now I'm in New York. And I'm struggling and I want to keep my travel, my, my, you know, follow my passion, but I need to feed the dream. So I tell people all the time, don't complain to me. I worked every, I worked Monday through Friday, plus every weekend in a basement writing stories for the people I competed against. I'm just like in this little, you know, doot, doot, doot. And it was most embarrassing. Like, I loved sharing the story. I had dated this guy in Texas. I had such a crush on him. And his roommate was a Fox News reporter, a national reporter. And he always gave me crap, this Fox News reporter. He just was always giving me shit. You know, it's just like, sorry, I didn't mean to say, I said shish. But he was just giving me, you know, like always giving me a hard time teasing and stuff like that. So fast forward years later, you know, because I used to, you know, we'd all be reporters together or whatever. Uh, years later, all of a sudden I'm assigned one day and I have to research for the reporters. I have to research and look at their stuff and pull video for them and do that. And I was assigned him. Like he was a foreign person. So I, he was never someone in, that was in the circle usually that I knew of. And I was like, I can't do it. No, no, no. How embarrassing. You know what I mean? Like, I'm going to be like the little baby writer for him of all people. And so I tried everything to switch. And I talked to the, my boss, can anyone else do it? I'll do two reporters instead of this one. You know, if he ever listened to this, he'd get a kick out of knowing I even cared because of course I acted like it was no big deal, but I thought it was good because it was only my first letter and my last name, you know, and I, the producers do a lot of the work with the writer. So the correspondent is out doing his thing. So it was the producer and me talking. They just knew me as Karen, no big deal. You know, I thought, oh, I escaped. So we get done, everything's fine until I get a call. You know, my boss is like, oh, so-and-so, the correspondent's on the phone. They want to talk to you. They go, hope you didn't mess up his story. And I'm like, uh, no. Oh, no. And I just remember he goes, Shayla, what are you doing? You know, like slumming and writing for me type thing. I was just like, oh, but the point is the reason I share all of these, you know, stories is I moved to New York with nothing. See the theme yeah. and wanted to reinvent myself because I cared about my travel show and I wanted to do it. And I was willing to do anything. How did you so get that writing you, gig at uh, Fox News? It's very hard to get. Oh, yeah. And that's actually a really funny story. So remember the book, the travel therapy book. I did travel. I went to Africa, just like I said, I was going to do for a month. And I started traveling for content. The book was almost no money, you know, but I didn't care. I got to travel. And that kind of was where the travel bug even more because I could travel for free. Like they'd fly me there and put me up because they got to be included in my book. This was really who, like, who's this? I don't get it. Who did just this? everybody in my book? I have like 200 different places. So whether I'm in Belize or I'm in Bali, you know, this is how the travel world works. So, you know, you don't make a lot of money as a travel writer, but you travel for free. So but you how, did you convince, how did you convince them to give you all this stuff if you didn't have a book yet? Oh yeah. Well, it was easy because I had done a little bit of freelance writing for a magazine, but you just reach out and say, Hey, I can do it here. I had a website. So back in the day, I remember blogging where I would like blog and I'd say, I'm going to do this blog. 
And sometimes I'd be a travel expert. You know, I was marketing myself as a travel expert. And so that was, but the point is when I had the book, so I got, I got some content. When I had my book, I had to market it. So I reached out to all the TV networks, all, and, and I wait, was Wait, wait, but you're skipping over. How did you get the book published? Yes. Oh, so that was easy. Remember, I'm back in Arizona and I have the idea. Right. So I came up with the treatment, you know, like you have to do. And that for people that don't know, you kind of have to say the premise of the book, you have to outline what the chapters are going to be. You don't have to write the entire book like you do in fiction. And so, and you have to write some sample chapters. And I researched agents that would do that type of content. And I just started emailing okay. and I had tried before for fiction and had never heard a peep from anyone and was told how hard it was. And so I really didn't expect a lot, but I heard back because it's what I talk about in, you know, anytime someone listens to me, it's really the idea. You don't have to be a superstar, but if you have a good idea and travel therapy is an amazing concept, you know? And so I was like, they said, yes. So the agent reached out, we talked, she loved the idea. So then she then took it and started pitching it. So while I'm flying to New York, I'm like, well, I'll be in New York to take meetings. And she, I, you <laughs> laugh now, people that know, she goes, you do know they don't meet with people. Like the publishers in New York don't, aren't like meeting with people. It's not like TV at least, or movies. At least not my people, like me. Maybe they're meeting with, you know, top people, but they're not meeting with me. But I didn't know that. I thought if I get to New York, how do I meet people that are publishers? Well, if I'm not there, if I go to uh, find out where they go and I'll go to a cafe or I'll just need to be around them, I'm certainly not going to happen in Scottsdale, Arizona. You know, so I had to go to New York. And so my plan, so I land in New York and I have a call from my agent that says, your book just sold while wow. I was flying. I mean, she'd been wow. trying, don't get me wrong. I'm like, okay, I'm here. Who am I meeting with? You know, I'm super excited. She goes, the one publisher that's in the West Coast in San Francisco. Oh, I'm like, what? And it was a really iconic publisher called Seal Press. And it was very, very well known and, you know, very, you know, back in the day, like really a supporter of women authors and women's rights, you know, and so many different things. The only one that was on the West Coast. So I was so bummed that I never did until my book launch party that was in New York meet my publisher. I didn't get to have that moment like I envisioned, right? Mm -hmm. I did get that moment when I got my deal with Harper Collins for my first Christmas novel. You know, the one, the Christmas camp, the movie you and your husband love so much. <laughs> <laughs> it was but, yeah. really perfect. I mean, you have to really buy into the whole thing. It's oh, very yeah. happy. It's Christmas. It's not going to be. Oh yeah. I mean, you do know there's more than 110 or something movies coming out almost every year. Yeah. Different, all the different networks are jumping in now. Yeah. It's not just Hallmark Lifetime, you know, the GAC. There's, they're, they're everywhere. I can and see why. People want it. And people yeah. want it, you know, people didn't. And the reason Christmas, I know we're kind of jumping all over the place, but the reason Christmas Prince was so popular, that's my first Which movie that Netflix. I thought was Hallmark and yeah. on Netflix. But the reason is, is because that's a very young audience at the time, the demo, they hadn't watched these Hallmark movies. And they were like, what is this schmalzy, cheesy, silly movie on Netflix? I mean, this became like a viral sensation because people were going, this is ridiculous, but I need to watch it over yeah and over again. Yeah. And if you go on my TikTok, and this is not a shameless plug, because I just got on because I said, I want to do something new this year. My book, you know, I just want to try something new and book talk I love is amazing. And I would scroll, I said, Okay, I wanted to share, maybe I can give tips what I don't want to just nobody wants to buy my book. But I want to say behind the scenes, I can tell behind the scenes stories, I can give writing tips if someone wants to write, I write so many different things now. So I jumped on and my third, it was really second. I had one TikTok from a year ago. I just wanted to get my account. So nobody took my name because that happens. So I just put like my couple books on there and don't know what I was doing. And so it was my second one this year. And I decided to do, I'm like, what do people want to know? And people love that movie so much. Now it came out, it, that's Christmas Prince came out in 2017. And I had somebody I was talking to that was like, oh, that's old news. People don't remember that. You can't use that. Like as I wrote it. And I'm like, well, I, you know, people remember the movie. It's always mentioned. So, you know, I didn't know. So I wrote, I, if you go on my TikTok, it's fun to see. Cause like I said, it was my third one. And I think I said five shocking things about when I wrote the movie, A Christmas Prince, something like that. You'd have to see it. Well, it went viral as viral as for me. I mean, I think I have almost 200,000 views, which is almost unheard of 22,000 you know, likes a ton of questions and everyone is fun to read them. That's why I said, read them. They're like, I'm obsessed with this movie. I watch it over and over. I have it on repeat because it makes right. me feel good. 
I yeah, watch it, it all year long. I've battled depression. I mean, I have serious stories of people like this makes me happy. This is better than any medicine. So this movie that everyone thinks isn't relevant touched people's heart in a certain way. Yeah, and if and anybody come back. Yeah, and everybody should look up Netflix, A Christmas Prince, and see the and see the um evaluations or you know reviews. And everybody loves this movie. And even people said this is not even my oh, kind of movie. They say it's cheesy. They even say this is the yeah. ridiculous. And oh, and there's a fun fact for you, uh, Chicago girl. Um, and I love this. There's so many goofy things. They shoot these movies quick. We always talk about that. Three weeks, right? Each, or less. So anyway, they shot this in Romania which is pretty cool. And they have this castle that's used a lot. So that's why when, you know, you see this magical setting and castle, it's a real deal. But then they shoot all the pickup stuff. Well, the story starts in New York City. So it's really funny because it's right when it says the director of photography credit, that's when to look for it. So you're opening credits, you'll see, you know, all of the names and the producers and getting toward the end because it's always director last. It's supposed to be kind of in, I think back in the day in order of hierarchy. I think it's because if you came late to the movie, the director and writer wanted to make sure they still got their credit because they, you know, I, I, I this is Karen Shaler making that up, but it is an order of hierarchy. That's a tradition. So director of photographers near the end, because it's very obviously important, but you'll notice a cutaway. It's supposed to be New York, New York. And there's a cutaway of a wide shot of a city with a flag. It's Chicago. Oh, that's so funny. And it's a Chicago flag and the Chicago Tribune, because this movie blew up so big, the Chicago Tribune had a huge thing, and I think in the lifestyle section it says, "Doesn't Netflix know where Chicago is?" Wow! You know, I mean, it was hilarious, and the reason it went viral, and you guys should find this because, oh my gosh, um, uh, Stephen Colbert did like a six-minute skit on the Christmas Prince as an opening wow. monologue, and it's hilarious, and it's kind of what we talked about how, and there's this, and there's this, talking about all this content, you know, this Christmas content. Yeah. But the reason, it, I think, one of the reasons besides people finding it and going wait, what, you know, and why do I, why do I like this? But I love it. Like, I remember one of the funny tweets that I read said, I'm watching this super sweet, ridiculous movie. My teeth hurt. This is the silliest thing. I want to poke my eyes out and I'm going to watch it 10 more times. That's so funny. And so people would admit that they love hated yeah. it, but what Netflix did itself was genius. I don't even think they realized at the time. And I'm not, I'm going to misquote it. And I should know this because it's iconic and you'd have to look at it. Um, look it up. It's funny. They put out a tweet. Netflix put out its own tweet that said something like to the, you know, 64 people who have watched a Christmas Prince every day for the last 18 days, who hurt you? Ooh. And so it became this thing. Yeah. And next thing you know, Whoopi Goldberg on The View is like, why are you tweeting? You know, why are you shaming me for watching? Maybe I want to watch it every day if it makes me feel good, you know, and it became this thing. Oh my God. And so all these years later, but the power of what we do, anyone that's listening that wants to be a writer and, you know, and I'm, we're sharing all these, that's what I love about, you know, when Margaret, we talk, we're sharing backstories, we're sharing personal stories to show you like, where do you get your content? You know, where do you get all this from? You know, you're going to pull from your imagination, of course, but there's always little bits and kernels, you know, in it. Somebody asked me the other day, well, you know, I have, it's Rudolph on this one, right? There's the dog. I right. have a dog on every cover. Last year it was called a Royal Christmas fairy tale and it was a, a really wide scene. And I'm like, oh, where am I going to put my dog? I, I designed the cover and then have a professional person put it together, but I have the vision for it. And I, there's a doc on it. And most people don't know. It's one of those like, where's Waldo? And the dog, my designer thought I was insane. So you would literally almost need a telescope. I mean, a um, uh, looking glass to see it, but the dog is on there. And so people assume I have a dog that I'm this huge dog lover. Well, I am a dog lover, but I can't have a dog because I traveled so much. You know, I was never home. Remember all those cities I lived in and worked as a reporter. And now I have a travel show and now I'm here you know, New York, LA, back and forth, you know, I'm going wherever I go, but I love dogs. So it's kind yeah. of like I make this caroling scene or big Christmas dinner scene in all my stories. Do I have it? No. Do I want it? Yes. Yeah, it's escapist. <laughs> I mean, some, yeah. sometimes, sometimes we write things that we don't have because it's a way to escape to another world ourselves. So. Exactly. Well, and what, tell me about, I mean, I'm just going to flip it on you. I know we're supposed to be talking, but your novel, what inspired you to write your novel? Because I think if people haven't, you know, tuned in, you know, maybe my people, um, what my people, people on my social, like watching this, because I mean, you are an author as well. And I love how you were inspired by where you live. Oh yeah. No. Well, basically it's like what you have. Um, but mine is not, mine's sort of dark. It's not like a uh, fairy tale like yours, but 
Great. It's because my life was very boring. It still is sort of boring. My life was very boring. And I started this fake blog and the fake blog still exists. And so I was, I pretended I was in my early twenties living and partying and having all these friends. And then I thought I should turn this into a novel, but, in, in, but set it back in the early nineties. So it's what called Burger Park Wishes. And it's really, but it's really about mistakes that people make mm -hmm. and, you know, a girl trying to find who she is and so forth. But I, I really felt like I suffered writing it because I became this character and yeah. I felt like my personality was split. And I felt <laughs> like sometimes I didn't know if it was me thinking things or my character, because it was like, I was trying to, it was like acting. I was trying to get into the character's head yeah. so much. And well, you hear so, about these method actors and you yeah. wonder like whether crack addicts, you're like, what exactly are you doing if you're a method actor on that one? You know, but yes, you yeah. start to think, and especially you're living this glamorous, fun party, probably a party life in the nineties. How much fun would that have been? Well, in I mean, but 20s? she also had issues, but the thing is yeah. this person was nothing like me and I had to become this other person and I had to feel everything and suffer and do stupid things. Meanwhile, my regular life was very normal. So if anybody looked at me, they didn't know all this stuff was going on in my head. And at one point right. I did tell a coworker, I said, I feel really crazy because in order to make it authentic, I have to really get into this person. Yeah. So, well, of course. I would love to talk well, about it. Yeah. I mean, why, I, would, did, I, would why did, I know, but I think people love hearing that, but why I just have to ask you a follow-up like you would do for me. Why okay. did you want to be, was that something like maybe pieces of you that really wanted to do something that you couldn't. And so you decided to yeah. create an imaginary character or what, what yeah, made because you I come had, up with that I had idea? Friend, because, because I'm not beautiful, you know, because this person, the character is very beautiful. She's very social. She has no problem getting guys. She makes a lot of mistakes. She's, you know, doing a lot of stupid things and I'm the opposite. I'm very careful. I'm not. First you know, of all, you're beautiful. Stop that. But you're, <laughs> I could see you being more careful. You're not like, whoa. You know, right. Cause I'm older. Yeah, I'm older and wiser now. I was an idiot back then. And I just wanted to write about somebody who's very, very different. And I would say if anybody likes music, it's really, it's like the song by garbage called a uh, stupid girl. I would say that's the novel. So, yeah. but yeah, I mean, my dream actually is for somebody to really interview me at length about this book. Cause it really yes. did come from a place. It came from a place from within myself and it came from feelings that I channeled into it. And I nearly went crazy writing it. And then I emerged from it and then I thought, okay, I've done it. But it. it's just well, sad. It's just sad when the public doesn't, the public really doesn't know much about it because there was a pandemic and I, yeah. I didn't do anything to publicize in person. So, and we were talking about that. And I said, and even in person, people aren't even doing that anymore. You know, even the top people like are showing up. Like I, my first book for travel therapy way back in the day, I'll get the time right. 2008 ish, not right. 18. Um, I did have like a book launch at the borders books, you know, right there in Manhattan, you know, it was amazing and, and all of that. But even now when I talk to like a Barnes and Noble, they'd rather do zoom because they can bring in more people, you know, people are busy. So I think this, this zoom, like, you know, we're doing, I miss in person though. I mean, I miss that connection of someone in an audience where I can see that they really want to ask, but they're shy you know, where you can reach out to them. You'll find me in Zooms. I just, I've done a lot this week for promoting my book and then announcing my Audible project yesterday or two days ago. And when all the squares come up on a Zoom, if you'll see, you'll see me like this because I get really close because I'm trying to find the person that, you know, especially if I'm the moderator that I know has a question and that's my reporting years. But I have to say this before we, before we uh, wrap on your topic of your book, because first of all, I love the title. I was just talking today, giving writing tips to um, one of my Zooms it was a really fun giving all these different writing tips. And I said, title, 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 you know, it's huge. So I love your title, but I just had an idea that popped the publisher came head. up with a title. Thanks to the publisher. Oh, okay. no, it's awesome. It's a great title. Uh, but I just had an idea come into my head that I think could be even more interesting than that. I think the story you just told, I think the story that could be the movie version of that isn't this the, the book story, it's the, your story. It's someone who wrote a book and yeah. almost went crazy having yeah. a dual character yeah. and living two lives. That's interesting. Yeah. That's okay, unique. cool. Because right? I was That's definitely going movie. through it. Yeah. And th this yeah. person, he doesn't work with me anymore. He, he I luckily bought the book, but yeah, I was telling him about the process because I couldn't sleep well and I was becoming this other character. And the thing that, the thing that's a bummer about art is that you go through all this stuff to create something and people out there don't necessarily care. And then you think you don't understand the suffering I went through yeah. <laughs> to try to make, to try to express all this and the rewrites and everything. But, yeah. but anyway, and no. I, tell, 
I yeah. tell people though too, um, who was it? And I'm not, I'm not even quote, but it's a very famous actor. And um, they basically said, I don't re read the good reviews about me. So I don't get a big head and I don't read the bad reviews about me. So I don't get neurotic. Um, and I find that so true. There's so many, especially now we're on such a different world, whether you're on TikTok, social media, um, you know, I, I just don't. I mean, I, I try not to. I like to read reviews because I want to learn and grow. If someone says something about, oh, I think this could have been this, or I really liked this, or I didn't like that. I want to listen, but there's so much noise. And I just think that sometimes you just have to tune out. I still read my reviews because I'm still growing. And well, you have so many mean, great reviews. I mean, my but, God. but I will say when there's a mean one, that's just viciously mean. Like it's someone that you feel like, okay, what did I meet this person in another life? You know, I do skip quickly. So if I see a review and I don't, luckily I have not knock on wood because this book just came out. Um, but if there's a hater on social media or something like that, I literally see, start to read and I'm fine with moving on. And I remember when I had boyfriends back in the day where we still wrote letters, if there's a breakup or something and I said, I'm done, I'm done. And they sent a letter, I wouldn't open it. And my friends would be like, how could you, you know, I go, I keep it, but I'm like, I don't need to know. It'll just be upsetting. And they're like, well, so I'm a person that can skip if it's, you know, so don't bother if y'all are out there going to say you talk too fast or you crazy little blonde girl. I will not read it. I will only see the first and just say, oh, well, to your opinion. I had somebody who hated Christmas on a podcast. It was, I think, during the pandemic. And it kept coming up these comments. And, you know, I was reading questions so I could answer. And it was a huge group of people. And it was like, why do you talk so much about Christmas? Christmas is the worst time of year. You're just being fake. And people are sick of hearing about your Christmas. And I'm like, so I, I, I did say at one point, I'm like, you do know this is a Christmas, you know, it's called Christmas camp. I was doing virtual ones. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, this is Christmas camp. Totally appreciate if you don't love Christmas, but this is probably not the place for you. But so, also it's weird because you're, because basically those people are demonstrating what the bah humbugs in your creation. Exactly. And sometimes I think it's goofing around. Like it's one of my friends messing with me with a faux name or something, right? You're like, what? so I just don't take it seriously. And I, I mean, when I say seriously, the haters, it's right. hard. I mean, God, if I was a celebrity, you know, up there in the world where paparazzi, that's a whole different level. You can't just ignore it. You know, like, you know, people like I can, but at the end of the day, I think, you know, as we go into the holiday season, I just always encourage people. It's hard. We all have something. We don't know when it's the teller at the bank or it's the person getting you coffee. You know, instead of getting frustrated, I try to take a breath and just say, I'm going to be grateful. And, you know, we don't know what they're going through. I've, I've learned a new line since the pandemic and dealing with some issues with my dad's health, where some days I just feel like, you know, I just can't, you know, I, I've learned instead of getting frustrated or angry or upset. I ask, what would you do if you were me? Whether that's a coffee that's spilled all over you on the ground, whether it's a life altering, you know, health decision. But if I take a moment, and ask somebody that's going off or being terrible or not being helpful and say, well, okay, okay. But you realize I have to do this. So what would you suggest I do? What would you do if, you know, and believe me, that's my secret trick in the last couple of years. It diffuses them and they actually have to think about it. And then usually they end up helping me where maybe they weren't gonna help me before. So if that helps anybody. So you get, it's like Jim Arnoff's class in Margaret's, right? Live streams. You get fun stories, behind the scenes and therapy all rolled right, into one. <laughs> right. no, okay, but I wanna um, I wanna get back to your show, um, the, the travel show, okay? Oh yeah. So you, you were able to do the travel show and and then how long did you do that for? I still am. You yeah, still are. Okay. I, yeah, I, I still am. I mean, okay. it definitely has taken a pause with COVID, of course. And the sad part was, is so I started the travel show and I originally started, I was just writing some online content and it's interesting the way the world works. I applied like anybody through the ABC portal, which I had not applied like that before. I've been in news jobs where you send a resume, you know, or a, a link to your real now but you know back in the day a resume tape even um a dvd oh my god how old am i um but all of that said you know with this i had i'm in new york everything's falling apart my plan a b and c i've moved to new york economy crashes every you know everything's sort of blown up i'm just like oh my goodness you know what am i going to do for money and so i'm looking for any job that i can get and i see this online travel content and i was already doing i had a few magazine clips when i was still in arizona because I didn't make any money. And I remember my mom said, well, you know, what are you really missing? You know, you don't have kids, you don't have a big mortgage or anything like that. And I said, well, I can't go to really cool restaurants. I can't travel, you know, because I wasn't making much. So I thought, 
why don't I freelance? Why don't I freelance an article? So I'd reached out to some lifestyle magazines and that's what I did. So I had a few, what we call writing clips. So I'm in New York, I apply for this job at ABC. The woman brings me in for an interview and this is for abc.com and it's just freelance. So just, you know, kick around some ideas. But when she brings me in, the irony is it turns out she was a former reporter and she talks as much as I do. I know, hard to believe, named Delia. I love Delia. And she, we start chatting and it's right before Thanksgiving because something interesting happens here. And, you know, she's like the head, one of the head recruiters, HR at ABC, you know, like ABC. And so we start talking. She loves my background. We start talking about travel. She's from Peru originally. You know, so we have this great chat. I noticed a travel poster on her wall. So bottom line, we connected. We weren't even talking about the job. But then in the end, she's like, I'm going to call the head person and called and said, you need to give her a shot. She's really cool. So it was a good example of not going in there. And it wasn't about the clips or this. It was about she thought I would be a good person to work with. I cared about travel. I'd showed knowledge of travel and those and being able to work and collaborate and all of that. And so at that point, you know, I had also heard that there was a travel show, ABC News Now at the time. And so next thing you know, I'm going to be a freelance correspondent on that show. Then I ended up, I'm just fast forwarding so people don't get bored, but I was a freelance correspondent for a little bit and I got paid like almost nothing. You know, like I'd go somewhere for 10 days and at first you think you have a photographer and you have a crew if I was local. They gave me a flip camera. I think I had to buy my own. It was this camera that came out for a hot minute. If anybody remembers, it was like the size of a phone and everyone was shooting like at the Oscars behind the scenes, like big fancy people. So they said, you can shoot it. We don't have a photographer. Economy's crashed. You you go to you know you go to Thailand and you shoot your video. Wow. I was like, in all my years of TV, I respect photographers. They know what they're doing. You know, um, I am not a videographer, but I went. You know, and I remember, and I'm so picky. I got a little baby tripod because you know I, I learned really quickly holding this little flip camera looked terrible. So I bought a little baby tripod and I'd put it there and I did this. And you know, the first ones I still look at. Then they would edit it. You know, I would write it and do it. It's called time coding. And then someone back in New York city, fancy pants, you know, would edit it. And these segments then would be on this travel show. I would stand, you know, in the studio and introduce it. Then the host left and I got to be the host. So for about a year and a half, I'm hosting and we go to like, we went to Chicago. I have one in Chicago. What was the show called? The one in um, for ABC was called travel now because it was ABC news now. It was that their cable 24 hours, kind of like with CNN when ABC had this cable content. I, I know it was very popular in Disney theme parks because apparently the show aired there. And when you're waiting in line, you're stuck. And so people would know me from the Disney theme parks, which I thought was hilarious. And so after I, I so then we started going to like Chicago. And so it would just be a half hour show and it would be me and I'd interview the deep dish pizza guy or I'd interview at one of the top chefs. And so then we went to um, Louisville, Kentucky, you know, so we did different things like that. But what I realized right away, meanwhile, I still had my travel therapy book had come out. That's what I was using as, you know, here, here's how I have travel. I have content. I have places I've been. And when my book came out, I was realizing, you know what? I mean, I need to do my own and own my own content because I'm hardly getting paid anything here. And so then the show, I think it lasted almost two years, but it wasn't at at one point I was, I think I was at four TV stations in New York at the same time working. Um, So I'm working in the basement at Fox news and the way that happened, you asked me and I didn't answer that. So when my book travel therapy came out, I started pitching it to get on to TV because I knew how to do that. And I got on Fox and friends. I did not have an agent. I didn't have any of that. But there was a caveat after I'd met one of the executive producers, they were short writers, like so short, like desperation short. And they said, well, why don't you come help us for this weekend as a writer and we'll get you on, you know, give you publicity when your book comes out. Nice. So I thought I was just going to go and kind of at first they wanted me just to write headlines. And then they're like, well, maybe you can mentor some of the younger writers. But turns out the younger writers ended up mentoring me, not so much in the writing style, but this system, you know, of pulling video and like all this stuff. I had no idea. There was this lovely, lovely um, girl, Monica, who saved me every day. I'm like, how do I get that out of the system? And how do I pull that video? And how do I find I me? Mean, oh, my goodness. It was the technical stuff I didn't know. And so, yeah. So when I was there. I'm also hosting ABC's national show, making union wage of SAG, which at the time was like $225. So I'd, I might travel for 10 days, but I got paid the one time I was on air. Oh my God. You know, then I can't eat that. So then I went to Pix 11 
and said, I want to do, I had all this travel content. I'll do this travel content for them and be a little travel expert. So I was also working there and I was still trying to travel and go to these restaurants and these, you know, I'd fly somewhere for a weekend to get content to try to feed the monster of all the other things I was doing. So I was hustling. So now when you say, wait, you write screenplays, you write books, you have a travel show. And now I started doing audio. I have a new audio multicast project, which is called Audible Original, which is a nod back to like the 1940s where it has a full cast. So it's written like a screenplay where it runs almost two hours and it's a full cast. And it's the only one that's coming out this Christmas with Audible in this format. It's called Once Upon a Christmas Carol. And I'm giddy about it because I'm now able to tell people that's a whole nother style of writing, you guys, yeah. writing for audio. Right. So now I'm doing that. But guess what? If I hadn't have been a hustler back in New York trying to pay rent, working all those jobs, I wouldn't have learned how to, you asked very early, how do you juggle your time? How do you find the time? You know, you stay very focused. And for me, I get up really early in the morning and, you know, knock off these things and just, and I also don't have a life, right? I didn't get married and have the kids. <laughs> I mean, I think people watching going, well, I have to take the kids to soccer. Okay. That is not in my equation. I don't right. even have a dog. Right. So there you go. So well, see, the, 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 the hustling you're talking about is very typical in New York, unless you're rich and you're well-connected, but a lot of people go to New York. This is why I love New York. I've never lived there. I used to go there often. I love the people and oh my gosh, if I could do something in New York and Chicago, I'd be so happy. But a lot of people do have that attitude. Yeah. Well, yeah, but I'm, I work, I'm over, I'm overemployed here. But the thing is that, you know, I have met a lot of people from New York um, or in New York and like Adam, Adam Wade, our common yeah. friend, and they do so many things because you have to do it to make it. And also another thing that I love mm -hmm. about New York is that people need other people to get ahead. Mm -hmm. You can't just Absolutely. be like isolated or hang out with your family or whatever. You have to actually meet people like what happened to you at Fox. Exactly. And a good example was um, I sat downstairs. So I remember I got, so I, I got my apartment sight unseen, which is not easy to get, you know, at any time, but you know, in New York, I'm in here in Arizona. Well, Upper West Side I knew, is nice though. Upper West, yes. Upper West Side. Okay. Well, and I, I pretty much knew I had to live there because remember when I back up a little, how everything connects when Lou Dobbs called me when I was in Arizona and oh, wanted me goodness. to work in Washington DC for him. He said, well, what about living here in New York? So I flew to New York to meet with Lou Dobbs wow. and I'm like, mm -mm. you know, I just didn't think so. But I walked when I left CNN center, which is at 59th street, Columbus circle. For those of you that know New York, he goes, well, walk on the East side, you know, there's great, see what it's like over there. So I walked on the East side and it wasn't me at all. Like yeah. it just was, it's that park Avenue, Madison Avenue, la di da di da. And I'm walking along. I'm like, mm -mm. So right around 72nd Street from the east side of New York, I crossed the park, which you can do in like 15 minutes, Central Park. And when as soon as I got to the west side, those are my people. Yeah. There's little wine bars. I mean, that's where a lot of the actors are. That's the straight shot to Broadway. A couple, you know, things I have the the New York Philharmonic was right there. I mean, I lived on 72nd Street, mm. you know, so right there I was by everything. I really felt like it fit me. So when I moved there, it was the least lonely I've ever been being a single person. Everyone eats by themselves. Very rarely, I mean, you might meet with a girlfriend, but people just go and everyone talks. So whether you're at a bar, yeah. you could even be sitting at a table. It's so friendly. On the I, subway, people would always help each other. Oh, over here, over here, you know? And but it doesn't matter about to, age, but it doesn't matter yeah. about age. So you could be older nope. and it still happens. I was older. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't 20. Yeah, I wasn't 20. You could be 70. You could be, there is... Yeah, that's a cool thing that I love about it too. I saw a lot of, and I mean people older, like in their eighties and they were walking with a cane, but guess what? In New York, I didn't have a car for 15 years. I didn't need a car. Yeah. And you, as an elderly person, I'm talking really old. They keep their independence so much longer because, you know, people lose their driver's license, but nope, they can still walk to the little bodega. They can still get their newspaper. They can go downstairs to the coffee shop and have their socialization. And I just remember thinking, this is, you know, Oh my gosh, I love New York. New York. I just hear you talk yeah, about New York it. Like, is I want to cry. Heart. And oh I my still gosh. am a New Yorker. I mean, I am part of the union and my plan was to actually go back because I'm doing different projects in different places. It makes sense right now for me to I'm based different places. So I, you know, instead of owning in different places with the pandemic, what it showed me is to be smart. My money guys like say your primary resident is the cheapest one for taxes and then just go back and forth to different yeah. places, you know, vacation rentals. That's what I had. I had a vacation rental. I kept my home in Scottsdale and rented it out and made a lot of money that helped me pay my rent in New York city. Nice. That crazy pants rent, you know, yeah. but New York's awesome. And I encourage anyone now 
I people say, what, what about, about the after dirtiness? the pandemic? Like, is it really dirty and crowded? It was never dirty. When I was there, it was not dirty at all. It's probably one of the cleanest places I've ever been. It's the Central Park, I could walk through at midnight. Now, I have to say the caveat that I left right in you know February of 2020. Right. Now, obviously, the pandemic, it became very hard, especially on my Upper West Side. That was part of the relocating people in the men's shelter up to hotels in my neighborhood that were empty. Right. And so all of a sudden there became crime and there became, it was dirty. And all of a sudden the New York, like people didn't feel safe walking in Central Park at night anymore. And the crime rate is up. They, I, I think New York, New York will always come back. That's what's magical. In New York, yeah. people are resilient. Yeah. But I have not been back. Um, I was there about six months ago, but I didn't live there. So I can't experience, you know, to give you a good analogy, but you know, everybody in the writers, a lot of our writers guild writers are in New York. My closest friends, you know, are there. Gerald Brenner. She's uh, amazing. Talk about a hustler. She's uh, as well, meaning she has done celebrity reporting, red carpet for years. She loves the human interest stories. She also wanted books when I met her. And so I helped her with that book proposal we talked about. And she has the My City, My New York. By the way, you have to get it. Anyone has to get it. It's, it's, she talked to celebrities about their favorite places, secret, top secret places like in New York. It's wow. so like Bette Miller will talk about her favorite place like in the park or like a George Clooney will talk about favorite place for a burger. You know, and I don't know if George is in there, but you know what I'm saying? It's that kind right. of book. And then she did the same one, My City, My LA. And, you know, she also is working on a play. She has a one woman, um, I'm like, oh, she's going to be mad at me. It started off as that, but now it is a, um, it has a full cast. So she's working on Broadway to launch a play mm -hmm. and she freelance writes for Parade. It's so New York, everything you're seeing, yeah. Exactly. So oh my, my point is, Margaret, you could, and you know what? I think too, I think at least I'm giving my own advice. I've been wanting to go back for two or three months, just, you know, stay there for two or three months, then LA two or three months, depending on what my work is. And I haven't done it because of so many things. And I think do smaller bites, go for a week, go for two weeks, you know, be mm -hmm. immersive, see what you could do instead of saying, I'm going to go for a year and you might never do it because that's right. a big bite to take. But if it's well, in your I'm heart, like, I'm, New I'm, York, also, it's I'm Right now I'm well employed. I mean, I'm just yes. fully, I'm overemployed right now. And I like, I like my jobs and stuff, but. And yeah. you're working on your screenplay. So you do not, that's taking up a lot of your time, right? I and mean, also you the have novel, so many the second novel, it's very time consuming. Yeah. I mean, like I said, I, love I, that. I know that's why, that's why I have a lot of respect because I've read people's novels and maybe I'm not that crazy about them, but I have a lot of respect. They finished it. They, you know, mm -hmm. so that's why I still, you know, give them publicity because I think I know what you went through. I mean, maybe not the suffering. <laughs> <laughs> the suffering I went through because it wasn't it wasn't just like you know technical stuff about writing no. it was the character oh. it was like acting yeah except you're oh, writing. I know so. when I see some of the actors the method actors you know that we love so much those roles that have to lose 30 40 pounds and yeah. and have to immerse themselves and they talk about their families you know they thank their families when they win Oscars for putting up with them while they were maybe this you know really immersive character I my, I can't, I don't even have the words and that's rare. My hat goes off to every single actor in any kind of acting. And, and let me just put a shout out to narrators because yeah. as writing an audible project, what I learned was all of a sudden I didn't have leaning into, you know, when you have an actor, even the sweater they're wearing or what they're wearing, it gives a ton of clues to who this character is, the decisions they make, what their day is like, you know, you already see that in what they wear before they open their mouth. Then they show up this beautiful house or they live in a house or they live in a dumpy apartment. All of that is, is storytelling. And right. you take all that away and all you have is a voice. And yeah. all of a sudden you have to write differently. So yeah, sure, I can learn to write. Oh, wow, look at that house. I've never seen so many white twinkle lights. It's such a charming little craftsman style. I want one. You know, okay, now I see it. But right. the point is, is when I heard the actors and we were going over the audio files, I mean, it was phenomenal. Like even when there's two of them dancing, they sounded breathless, like they were twirling. And I'm like, it yeah. sounds like they're dancing. So shout out to everybody, you know, that is in that industry. And well, I just that, that's why, I mean, that's why it's up. interesting about this, uh, these audible projects, because um, old radio, old time radio is all yes. about that. And they painted yes. a picture for you before TV came along. Do you remember, you see, I remember like my grandma would talk about like is Orwell, right? It's people would sit around the radio. Yeah. And they'd sit around, I think, you know, in the 1940s and excuse, you know, excuse me if I'm wrong, but they'd listen to these stories 30, and the family yeah. would gather around yeah. and anyone looking to write um, for any kind of audio project. When I first got it, I always, everybody knows me. I'm a researcher, probably my background. You know, I didn't know how to write a screenplay and I did. I didn't know how to write a novel. I did. I just researched, researched, researched. 
and that everything from tips to actually reading the content, you know, and watching and, you know, whatever it, it takes. But with Audible, it was hard because these Audible originals are kind of newer, right? These, yeah. these multicasts, there weren't a lot to listen to, but guess where I found them? I mean, anyone in the audio world knows in a minute, the BBC, because they're That's killing true. it doing oh, yeah. these originals well, they've and also these been doing multicasts. It for, but it's often doing it for like a hundred exactly. years. Exactly. You know what I mean? And that's where listening to that, I got so many tips. I just did a deep dive and would listen. I go on this walk, you know, and I just listen and I just listen and I learned so much. And it was fun. Like one of the, one of the processes for it, people say, well, how did you go from writing a screenplay to writing audio? I mean, how do you even start? And the way I started is my story idea I had was a movie idea. You know, so when I got the opportunity to pitch, I had ideas and I knew this one would be good. It's called Once Upon a Christmas Carol. And we have classic Christmas carols in it. And there's clues in the lyrics. And I actually wrote an original song. So we got to bring a violinist in and we, you know, to do to score, I mean, these classic songs, but make beautiful music along with this amazing cast of actors. But I knew in my heart, but then I'm like, how do you even do a transition? Right. Like on TV, it's a commercial break. That's easy. But in a movie, you know, there's a transition. But how do you do a vote? I mean, an audio transition. And so I thought, OK, and I, I started thinking, trying to think. So what I did is I went to one of the sites where you would buy if you were a producer, the sounds like sound effects. Right. And I put in Christmas, holiday, snow, winter. And all of a sudden I heard like the howling wind. So then I, I literally had 100 sounds and I backwards engineered it to where I knew the story but I had to use the sounds. So it was interesting. So instead of just people talking back and forth, okay, there'd be the tea kettle. Oh, it's hot cocoa. Or, oh yeah, do you want whipped cream? You know, on your, your shh, you would hear that or the crunching of the boots crunching in the snow. So that's how I did it. I, I, I fell in love with the sound first and mm -hmm. then found a way to incorporate every sound that I felt felt like Christmas and then wrote a story for it inside that is, the story. It's interesting that you come from TV because that's a very radio approach to do because, and even audio, because yeah. some people who do videos, they start with the audio first, you know, even music videos, they start yeah. with, the, they start with the sounds and then they build it up from that. And they, and they fill it. But in this case, because I just was terrified that how do you, I'm going to write it. This is auto, you know, audio. I want you to feel the magic. I'm all about with Christmas, taking you to a place. You know, we talk about on book covers, um, if you go, it's just for fun. If you're interested in books and, and that type of thing, um, go to, just go to Amazon for say, and put in Christmas romance and you'll see, and you know, still what we call landscape. This is like a landscape cover because it's taking you someplace. But what have gotten really popular are the animated covers, right? Where it's, they're more hip. It's like two little people, or it's right. like just some holly and really cool font. But these are still kind of the experiential that take you there. So I'm always a thing about writing Christmas when I give my tips. Christmas has to be a character. I want to lean into nostalgia. I want the imagery. I want to see it. I want to feel it. I want twinkle lights. And you say, that's for movies, Karen. You're reading a book. No, you know, um, yeah. The way you read cover... it, it's not boring. But the way, the, yeah. I'm sorry, the way you write it, it's not boring. And my cover designer, I drove her nuts. Every one of those is a little twinkle light. And I'm like, can you add more to the trees? <laughs> Can right. you do that? You know, she's like, well, I think I'm like, no, no, there's never too many. But also, no, it's not, it also it goes with the story because in the story, yeah. there's, it's like overdrive. There's a lot of decoration. Exactly. exactly. And that's what we think is magic. So when I wrote Audible, now I'm in my Christmas space. I know how to write a book. I know how to write a movie and make you feel Christmas. How in the world when you don't get to see it? And yeah. it's so visual to me. And I'm so visceral about, you know, I'm, I'm from television, you know, all those years as a broadcaster. I mean, I think pictures, that's what I think. I mean, I know a story and if there's no visuals, I don't think it's a great story. I'm like, I need to tell it with pictures. I am so the opposite of what would traditionally be an audio writer, but that's why I loved it because I truly learned something new. And then I be, just became obsessed because the power in it and the sound was such a different emotion. And then it got better in my writing, Margaret. I went back to my screenplays, my movie screenplays and added in some sound hmm. that I wouldn't have added, right? right? But I realized how important it was. And it's just yeah. was so much fun. I am, I, you know, you never have your favorites of writing because everything's like a child, you say, but the, I really believe it's one of the best things I've ever written. And I am so proud of it. And I'm proud of the cast. And I never told you that story. So as a writer, we don't get to in movies, pick our cast. People ask that all the time. No, half the time, I don't even know when my movie's airing, much less get to pick the actor. Yeah. Um, and so in Audible, 
it was so great. It was such a great collaboration. I'm sure every situation is different depending on, you know, the need and, and want, but because they knew I was in television and they knew I was very involved, I had the idea right away of having one of the Hallmark to do cross promotion. Let's bring in, I write Hallmark movies or Lifetime or Netflix. Let's bring in someone that's known in the TV world into the audio space and they'll bring those fans because I think they'll love it just like I loved writing it. And so I proposed a Hallmark actor that I had met only briefly at an event, but his voice is one of the best voices I'd ever heard. And I thought if I have to listen to somebody and not see pictures and it's only gonna listen to them, it, and it's going to be romance and it's really going to be magical. I could listen to his voice. So I just reached out and asked if he'd never done anything with audio. He'd always wanted to. And he was willing to, you know, hey, he didn't have a resume tape. So I just took clips of him doing TV appearances and sent them. And Audible gave me a shot to pitch him. And that was a risk on my part, because keep in mind, I'm brand new with Audible, never done this. And if I bring in a star that for whatever reason, not a personal friend, not somebody that I know, if I bring it in, he's a crazy person, or he doesn't do a job, they're probably not going to hire me either, because I, I went out on a limb, you know, but his voice was magic. And when I heard it, I was holding my breath. I mean, I'll admit it, you know, I was scared. I was like, Oh, my goodness, I'm sure he's going to be amazing. But I hope he enjoyed it. I hope they enjoyed him. You know, you, all of a sudden, you realize, wow, when you recommend somebody, there's a lot that goes into that. That's why I probably don't usually do it. But I felt like I got to be a part of it. And what nobody knows, because I haven't shared this with anybody. So it's live streaming. This is the first time you're going to hear it. I've been telling people I've been given permission the last couple of days to let people know that Audible is coming out because I have contracts and you're told when you get to tell you know, these things. So the cover's out. I've been putting it on social media. I've talked about the actor that I didn't name and I definitely should name him. His name's Ryan Pavey. And if you know Hallmark, any Hallmark, he is one of Hallmark's and he's always does Christmas movies. He does a lot of other movies. He was on General Hospital. His voice is magic. He's magic. He's an amazing guy. I'm so grateful. And then Brittany Presley is our star as well. And she's in the audio world. Like this is her jam. Like she kills it on, you know, book narrations, multicast. She does everything. She's won awards. She's phenomenal. And all the rest of the cast. I mean, every single person. And I'm not just saying that. They, you know, we we would the auditions were like. 12, 13 people I would get to look at. I mean, you know, they, it was, we put it, I mean, no, we really great. worked hard. No, that's really great that you can do that because sometimes we have a vision for who should do something, but we don't yes. get a choice. Well, here's what's great. Thank you. You led me into this exclusive story that I was going to tell you. And I was wondering, I've been not overthinking it, but so much is going on. I'm like, well, when do I wonder when I should share this part of it? Should I wait till it comes out? But okay. So I'm sharing here. So that's exactly right. When I came up with the idea. So I researched, I had the story idea as a movie. So I'm researching sounds so I can blend the worlds. And I knew right away, because I had just binged Bridgerton, that I wanted a lady whistle down like narrator. I wanted Julie Andrews. I wanted that regal voice that when you heard it would just be kind of weaved through and kind of help with the magic. And especially with audio, I saw on the BBC, that was one of the things they did a lot, right? That was, how do you connect things? Well, that was a way. And I, I was like, this is perfect. So when I wrote the description for the director and producer of who they'd be looking for, I said, you know, Lady Whistledown, uh, Julie Andrews, regal, wonderful, deep, rich voice, kind of all knowing and all of this. Yeah. So I do that and I'm getting all the people, all the different cast members to listen to. And I'm actually at um, an event and it's where they have all the uh, movie stars and they, I was there to talk about screenwriting and writing novels. And it's a fan event where they get to come and see you and, and all of that. And I had lost my voice. Imagine that, you know, from talking. So I sounded kind of hoarse and I've got the auditions for our narrator for our Once Upon a Christmas Carol. And I'm listening and I immediately am so mad at myself because they all read it the exact same way but obviously I didn't write it correctly I probably missed that comma you know or something because it, it just it wasn't the uh, uh, that I'd really right. wanted and so I couldn't pick one they all were wonderful that it auditioned but I because I couldn't hear this at grand inflection there was no way and it was so important I mean to me it was like such a key you know the opening voice right you know I'm just like yeah. I, I got to get this right so I'm walking with the phone I, you guys can appreciate it and I'm dictating you know and I to, to audible and I'm saying my bad you know version of so sorry I don't think I put this right is there any way this is where the inflection needs to go it has to go high low is there any way we could have them you know 
And as I'm writing this big, long thing, I'm not even making sense to myself because I'm trying to explain. So I just, oh, screw it. So I'm going to record. I have to look on my phone how to do that. You would know, Margaret, but I'm looking on my phone. So I email him and say, forgive the terrible voice because I've lost my voice. But I just said, this is how I want it to be. That, uh, you know, kind of the, I don't even know what you call it because I'm still so new in the world, but you know, the way, the flow. Mm -hmm. I, and so um, my head contact email back, she goes, oh, I thank you for doing that. Now I see we can absolutely, you know, do that. That makes so much more sense. That's great. That's how I kind of heard it too. I'm like, Oh God, I love audible. I really do. They've been so yeah, amazing. Great. So 20 minutes later though, I get an email back and they're like, Hey, I gave this to the producer director and we think you should be the narrator. Whoa. And I'm like, you should, for seriously, I'm like, wait, what? I'm like, no, no, no. I go, first of all, this deep voice is not my voice. You know, this is my cold voice. Oh. And I, the narrator is a really important part. I don't want to mess up my story with me being a narrator. And they're like, no, we thought that it was really good. Of course, it's up to you if you're not comfortable. And I'm like, and so my first thought, and this is where I like to share because we do this in Jim's class and I'll share it with everybody. My first thought is like, are they just being nice? And then I remembered, hello, this is a multi-billion dollar industry. Right. Nobody's really just nice, no. you know, but then I thought, I don't want to mess it up. And I don't have a lot of self-doubt, meaning I don't think I'm all that, but I also am pretty fearless. But because I care so much about this story, I don't want to mess up my own story. I want Julie Andrews. You know, that's what I want. I want one of these amazing actors. I have never even had an acting class. I've never done improv and you have to act. I'm not a broadcaster. And I said, well, I'm only done broadcasting my real, you know, facts. And she said, well, why don't you think about it? But the team that's, and she's so great because she would never say it like I would say it probably wrong. She just says everything wonderfully. She just says, but the team, something to the effect that, you know, bottom line, what I took from it is the team, they do this for a living. Right. And they think you'd be great. Wow. And we think it would be a great nod for your listeners because you are the story creator and the narrator is this role. And, you know, and it's a small role, but, you know, it's just like a Mrs. Whistledown where she pops up. But I think at the most important times to have when you hear her, there's something to say, right. you know. And so I my first gut reaction was I wasn't feeling well. My voice was bad. I'm like, I'm not messing up this. I This is too precious to me. I love it. And then I said, you know what, for once in my life, I'm going to get out of my own way. These are audible. These are people that do this for a living. They know more than I do. And if they think I can do it and that I'm going to do okay, I'm going to believe them. Yeah. So I said, yes. So next wow. thing you know, on my doorstep, I got this huge kit oh and they God. walked me through it to set up and everything. And guys, I am the narrator. That's incredible. I did not expect that at all. I know. And I'm freaking out. Well, about did they coach because... you? Did they coach you at all? Oh, I'm so great. It? So Thank God having the broadcasting. And but that's what she said, because I wrote it. So I knew exactly. That's why I was so like, no, 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 no. It has to be like, you know, the other one's not because actors will make it their own, you know, and I want them to. But Lady Whistledown is Lady Whistledown. And it's funny because my executive hadn't seen Bridgerton. Okay. So when I kept saying Lady Whistledown, I'm sure it was like, like what? Mm -hmm. And finally they said, well, I don't. And I'm like, oh no, we, it's like this. So they said that, that director, the producer, director, they were going to be there. So she was there. And so I recorded it and I was losing my voice. I was coughing and we had to push it one day um, because my voice was so terrible. I thought it'd be better in two weeks and it wasn't, you know, and I'm drinking tea and I'm doing all of that. But yes, when I was there, I'd say, so tell me, obviously slow down. Do you want this? And so maybe at the end where I'd be like, I would tend to drop my voice because it was dramatic. It would be like, duh, 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 duh. And she goes, let's do that, but let's go up because we don't want sometimes, especially with my cold, my voice would disappear. And you appreciate, right, where you work. You get this more than most people. So yes, the answer is yes, she did coach me. And what was so great, the opening is so important. And I never am nervous, but I was. I feel like I've done everything. And I'm like, well, let's just try it if it doesn't. But I was nervous because I was worried my voice would give out. And I wanted to really do make everybody proud, including myself. Um, so we did the first one and then we did all the other clips. And then she said, do you want to go back and do the first one again? You know, now that you're warmed up, right. and I'm like, yes, I do. Yeah. You know, yes, I do. And I felt much better about it. Now, when I heard it for the first time, I literally didn't listen when she first sent it to me. So I'm, I'm going to listen to the whole thing and I can give notes, which was great. I'm like, oh, the sound there a little, what about that? Oh, does, what about, you know, and I got to say, oh, that texting noise is a little weird. Is there something, 
you know, and I always give examples because I, you know, here's an example and I give a link to the sound in the sound system, not audibles, but generically, right. but they're so good. I mean, they know exactly what they're doing. They didn't need Karen Shaler giving them any tips on that, but it was interesting because I'm listening like, you know, like a listener will, and they're in a multi-million dollar studio listening. So I got to pick up on a couple things as a regular Joe listening on an iPhone, you know, right. or whatever that they said was helpful. But when I heard my voice for the first time, and there's music, there's a song I picked, and I'm not going to give a spoiler alert on that. Um, but there's a really special story to the song I picked that every time the it's, it's I used her as a transition that every time the narrator speaks, there is a song and you know, she's going to be there and it's going to be imparting some kind of wisdom. And the song is really has a very special meaning. Um, and so two hours or how long is it? I, you know, it's funny when I listened to one of the final last cuts, it was round. And I think I can say this right now, if you go on Audible's website, you can pre-order it. It says it doesn't have the time yet because, you know, they might start different. I'm not sure how it works, but it was under two hours, but it was like an hour 45, right in that range. So it's just like a movie. That's what I said. And it's an Audible original. And some people asked me because I had to ask so I could explain it correctly. So if you're in the Audible Plus program or the Audible subscription program, then it's free. And so I said, well, then how come you pre-order if you're getting it free? And they said, because if you pre-order, then it's automatically delivered into your library on December 1st. Yes. And if you don't have any of that, they say almost everybody either gets a subscription over time because it's so affordable, you know, but if you want, you're just a one-off and you want a one and done, or you want to check it out. I think it was like $14.95. So you can still get it. You don't have to have the subscription, but there's so many deals and especially with black Friday coming up, you know, and, and other holiday, you know, deals out there. I saw, and don't quote me on this, but instead of like, whatever it is a month, they had like four months for five ninety five, and they had all these deals. And what I did yes, all day yesterday, Margaret, your world, I can't wait to tell you. And I wish I could tell you more, but as a promotion, I can't tell you how or why, because it's the coolest thing though. I worked with Pandora wow. yesterday and Sirius XM. And the way and is Pandora on the West coast. Where are they based? I think so. I, I I did it. We did it virtually. We did it virtually. Um, but we were putting together a really, really, really special uh, mm. promotion and project mm. that's going to go with the release of that's really the cool. Audible. That's really so. Cool. Yeah. So it's but I, any writer out there, what I would say is I think the audio space is really a space you want to get into because originally there was there's short story content. There's now if you're an author. You can write original just for Audible. So it, they get it. It's theirs, you know. But um, I thought Audible wasn't taking submissions or pitches right now or something. Because I went to well, the web. You know, oh, oh, maybe it's for podcasting. Yeah. And I also think the website, I mean, things like that, you know, come yeah. and go and change. What I literally do, if you're interested, whether it's Audible or, or any other people that are producing audiobooks, I literally Google it and I see what's happening. Oh, they dropped a new short story romance. Well, those websites, who knows when they get updated on any company. So I never listen to that no submission-y thing. I just find the news and make sure it's current and I see who's being quoted and I try to reach out or find somebody in that lane by doing, remember the research and right. say, hey, I have this or I'm looking for this. And I like to share that when I originally, um, when Audible, it was, I also write beyond Christmas, although it hasn't been out yet, but writing different things. And so they were looking for romantic comedies, not Christmas. So I must have pitched eight or nine stories, just log line types pitches. And it was like, no, 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 no. Just wasn't right. Wasn't the right fit. And I finally, I didn't give up. I'm like, so can you tell me your favorite rom-com? Because then, or comp, like, are you looking for Harry Met Sally? Or are you looking for Love Actually? Are you looking for, you know what I mean? Like I was trying to get in the heads of the executives, but there's been so much, just like everywhere, so much transition. They were still figuring out what they wanted. But bottom line, none of the ones I had pitched, they wanted, right? And when I originally reached out, I reached out as Christmas content girl. And they said, we're not doing a Christmas one this year, not this multicast. Um, we're not doing one. So I was like, okay, but I got other stuff. So I pitch, 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 nothing, nothing. So the first of the year happens, the first of this year, and I reach back out, checking in. And I have some new regular, you know, rom-com, love to pitch. Okay, sure. So I pitch a couple. No, <laughs> now most people at this point would probably be like, but I was like, okay, well, I'm going to keep Well, it's like on. sales. It's sort of like sales, but you're selling yeah. ideas. And I, I didn't hurt my feelings. They have to find the right fit and they don't know it until, you know, it's this visceral thing. So I said, okay, well, I'm going to keep trying. And it must've been, I don't know, a day later, all of a sudden that executive reached out and said, just had a conversation. We've decided to do one Christmas this year, one multicast. Wow. And your name came up. 
Do you have anything? Literally, I think the email was, do you have anything laying around? Because we had to work really fast. So it had to be a concept that at least I'd already, you know, had an idea. But then we, the great part was we collaborated. And a lot of times you do that in all of your, maybe not so much as an author. It depends on who your editor is, especially if you're an indie author. A lot of times you're in it alone. Hopefully you find another editor developmental that can help you with ideas. But in the movie world, you collaborate a lot, you know, a lot of changes, you know, but Audible was so great because I had a movie idea and then we changed so many things. Well, this would be better for this and this and everyone, and I'm not exaggerating, every one of the notes, because again, I'm new to the world. So I was just open to anything and spongy, like, please teach me. And they were great. They were spot on. So that helps. That helps when you have executives that are, you know, the story is flowing. And anytime there was something, there was one thing that we were both going back and forth on, but it ended up being a miscommunication. Like, you know, and once we both figured out what the other one was talking about, we're like, oh yeah, sure. We got this now. So Uh the whole, I, I don't want to sound like, you know, butterflies and puppies and everything, but because it's such a hard go in Hollywood sometimes, where you're not part of the process or you feel a little left out or it's just a rough go period. Um, it sure was nice, you know, being with a true collaboration and a true team that wants to tell stories and everyone was as passionate as I was. I don't know. Do you, Margaret, feel that way? Cause I know how passionate you are and how much you do, not just for your job, but beyond and how much you give back. Do you well, ever feel solid. like you're the only of- one that cares so much? Yeah, but I mean, I, what I do is not collaborative. It's like I, a lot of what I've done is solitary, but I was going to ask right. you that question is, how do you calm down enough to sit and write for many hours? Because you're very lively <laughs> and energetic. I'm, thank you for not calling me hyper. Yes, a lively. Um, well, well, hyper is like, like I, hyper sort of has a negative connotation because I hyper know, means that's true. Yeah, you're not hyper. You're very energetic and. But thank you, Margaret. I love you. This is why I love you. <laughs> See, you, but, you're learning a lot. You're from my Jim's friend who class. I never met offline. But anyway, yes. um, <laughs> Jim, Jim would be so Jim would be so proud of us and our language we're using tonight. He would be so right. proud. No, but Jim, our, like. Our, yeah. Yes, you're right. You're very right. And Jim would never let me get away with using that word. And Jim, for if you've joined, is our uh, in the Writers Guild, we have a first Friday once a month class. And he's a coach, not only with helping us navigate the screenwriting or wherever we are world uh, therapy, sometimes you feel like too, but he uses language and the words you say matter. And, and, and you don't say, well, I might someday. Yeah, I'm working on Audible. I mean, you know, I tried to write it. You say, no, I wrote it. Right. You know, you don't say, well, I didn't know what I was doing. You're like, no, you're working for, you know, a goal. Like, he, it's really interesting because it. when I hear other people speaking and what I think Jim would correct, I, I agree. Right. You know, you t- totally like 100%. But how do I calm down? Well, I write before the world gets in the way. So I'm the type of person that rolls out of bed. And I don't go on social media. I don't talk to anybody. I don't look up anything online. And I just start writing. And what time do you I, wake up? Um, I've, normally 5 a.m., but I've been getting up at 4 because I have a lot of things going on. And the reason I was so disrupted writing this little baby and the reason I'm behind, I have a couple scripts that I need to get to people waiting for them. And the reason I'm behind in that, and that's not my this MO. Baby, but I, not, this, wait, this little baby meaning what? Because you just held book, up like, this for audio too. The book called yeah, what? Sorry, the book. No, this little baby. The book called was, what? Because because this oh, is also going to be a podcast. The same one. Sorry. Oh yes. Oh yes. Love, Love always, Christmas. always Christmas. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Okay. Yes. Very give very good point. <laughs> um. So yes, with Love Always Christmas, my latest novel that came out was tough because I was dealing with we mentioned some family health issues. So all of a sudden I get up at five a.m. and twofold. Um, being in Arizona at the time that I was writing it, I'm on the West coast. So my East coast people are up at 5.00 AM at eight. I'm already getting, you know, tons of emails of things to do. And Europe, Europe people, it's even worse where at least when I was in New York, I could get up at five and none of my West coast Hollywood people would bug me for at least three or four hours. You know what I mean? Like I had that sacred time to myself, but it's been hard where I had to carve out time where all of a sudden in my head is dealing with something like a doctor for my dad or, you know, just, you know, life was getting in the way a lot where I didn't have that before I could just focus and then deal with life. But when you're in emergency situations, you don't get to plan as we all know, you know, that's not, that's not how life likes to laugh at us. So I've had a hard time and what I'd like to learn, I put out in the universe. I like to write and I'm very focused. So I shut down. I don't talk miracle and I write. And if I start did this now, I could not, go and write two hours tonight or even an hour because now I'm this now yeah. I'm I, now I'm energetic I'm in a different creative space I can't calm down to write this characters aren't talking to me but I need to learn how 
because I'm finding I'm not getting two or three hours chunks of time anymore. I'm going to need to teach myself to be more disciplined. How do I write when I can? And you know who I, I suggest anyone? I did the master class. Um, one of the ones I took, it's a master class, and you go on and you pay a subscription, and it's all of the top writers that you could ever want and you can learn from. But Shonda Rhimes, uh, even if you don't write, want to write TV episodic, even if you're an author, there's authors on there too. You know, it's everything, it's amazing. But she talks about how, especially when she was writing her TV series like Grey's Anatomy or things, and as a showrunner, how chaotic it could be, that she'll put on headsets and like blast music and write because it trained her and kind of taught her how she can write anywhere and under any circumstance. I am not that person. I like my little quiet Zen. But how do you, moment. but how do you quiet down and how do you have the discipline? Because in the that? morning, in the morning, I know that's what I do in the morning. No, it's psychologically it's though. Time. I mean, because, yeah, because no, it's psychologically it's like morning, you're, oh, yeah. I'm going to write period. And that's, so that's, okay. you know, it, you know, it's like you, before you go work out, you're like, I'm going to go work out yes. and you kind of hype yourself up. But it's the same with hyping yourself down where you're like, this is my morning time. This is different. And I have two gears. I have one or 10. I don't have middle. So I'm very good at being quiet and, and, and very, you know, get things done. And I'm very good at going out and meeting people and talking and, you know, having fun and socializing and, you know, get to have interaction. So I love doing these so much right now. But how do you, you know, write? Okay. But how do you structure a script and how do you structure a novel? Because yeah, structure a novel, because your structure is incredible and tight. Your Aww. story structure. Yeah, much different than the way I tell stories, right? Which is, no, it doesn't hurt my feelings. Like when I tell, you, you, listening tonight, you know, I'll just go on and into tangents. Well, as a news reporter, I would be in Afghanistan and I'd have a minute and a half to tell a story. On average, it's three words a minute. So you have 90 words to tell a story. So I've learned from many years of how to be brief how to take a huge story and narrow it down. Now, family and friends or anyone listening tonight would go, well, I really wish you did that today. I don't have the ability in my personal life to do it because I don't have to, you know? So I think it's why I'm extra chatty in my personal life because my other world, I had to be very brief. And so I think when I'm writing a story, I know that I want things to move fast. I get very bored quickly. And that's why things like TikTok are fun for me because I can scroll in that content. I'm not saying that's necessarily a good thing, but I can scroll and the audience is different. We were talking about this with some authors the other night in one of these um, great get togethers that we had. It used to be in a book. You could write these beautiful, you had more time, right? And you'd write right. these beautiful setups and this beautiful prose and you'd look at language and words, but because of social media and because of the world we live in and you know all of those things, books are starting to look more like screenplays. Books are starting to get to it. You know, they say in screenplays, don't tell the backstory, you know, and then have the tsunami happen. Start in the middle of the tsunami. Mm -hmm. Start with the, the waves hit you, you were doing this. Then you reveal and find out, not three chapters until the tsunami. So that's how you do screenwriting. Well, it's kind of getting that way with books, you know? Um, no spoiler alerts with my book when you read it, but my opening, I changed. It was much different than it just jumps kind of right into something, you know, that I hope would grab people visually, you know, even though it's a book. So I think that that's how I'm able to do it. I think the background of knowing I don't outline anything. I have a beginning. I know my beginning and I know my end and I know the journey I want them to take. So the care you'd say character arc, I know how I want them to change, but I have found sometimes for um, movies, if you're hired as you know a union writer, you have to write what's called a treatment, which is basically an outline, which is basically like a bad word in my you know thought process. And I get why we need it, but every time I've written a treatment, which is this outline, kind of this you know do 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 do, do five six seven eight pages outlining the beats and everything you're going to do. When you actually sit down and write it, it changes. Right, because of the, the characters. Char yeah. Right, the characters. People think we're insane, Margaret, but you can even say the characters take over. Right. You right. might have a plan for your character. You might write this perfect Bible of, you know, I have 95 pages to outline my 300 page novel, but you start writing and I'm sorry, it doesn't work that way. So I don't, I don't outline. Now this one, I, if I had outlined, I wrote it with an idea and it was a very, I don't want to say basic idea. And I realized, oh, it's just like everything I've watched and read. 
I just want more. My characters deserve more. I'd fallen in love with my characters and they deserve better than what I had written. And I was in a hurry to write this. I was, I was under duress and I was in a hurry. And so I just felt like I cheated my characters because I love them so much. So I literally went over, even though I had zero time and it almost killed me. I just felt like this almost book didn't happen. You have no idea how many times it almost didn't happen from everything that could go wrong, did go wrong, you know, from the cover to the interior, just, just crazy things where I literally am like, is this book not supposed to happen? You know, but I think it's one of the best things that I've written too, because of that struggle. And I think the reason that I switched it is because when I got the original idea a while ago, I wasn't going through the personal drama, family drama. Not that my, when you read this family story, this is not my family story, but I did pull from things that are difficult with family and in a generic sense, you know, and, and things like that to just know the struggle's real, you know, so we're all in that. But yeah, so for me, I think at screenwriting, you have to keep it short. They, yeah, there's the rules like, but it's, like, also, it's also how you structure the story, like things are tied up or things are connected. I mean, do you know that as you're writing or do you do it in the oh, rewrite? Oh, like the what? Easter eggs. Oh yeah, that's, I see what you're saying. Yeah, and that's where I get so mad in screenwriting when they don't get it. Like I leave all these things and then they're all tied up in a big bow at the end. Yeah. And sometimes they'll cut a scene and that totally, but they just look at the right. scene and go, and that's my fault. I have my little special thing in the scene that's going to be cool later, but yeah. I maybe didn't bring enough information to the scene to make it worth it, right? Like every scene has to move the story forward. I do not think of those ahead of time. Okay. I just write them. And so, every once in a while, I'll go back and I'll say, oh, why don't I, okay, I know I have this, like, this isn't giving anything away. I have a Christmas wish bell in my story, Love Always Christmas. And it's one of the, it's one of the fun little traditions in this charming mountain town called Crystal Falls. And it's in the cafe that everyone goes to. And you ring the bell and make a wish because you ring the bell so Santa can hear it. I thought that's fun. I haven't heard of that. I'm going to do that. So I had that. I already had that. And then, you know, when I got done and I'm reading and editing, I thought I want to add a little more context of where the bell came from. And then I decided to have a couple connections to the bell later, right? So that's, I'll drop things knowing. This one's tricky because it has a mystery. I say this one because I'm holding up Love Always it Christmas. A mystery, yeah. Because it has a mystery too. So mm -hmm. it's the first time I've ever weaved a mystery in and it has riddles. And I had to come up with those riddles. That's why I said, for one that, you know, I was having a lot of issues in my personal life and a time crunch, I certainly put a lot into this one, you know, like in terms of, oh, let's have rid uh, riddles, let's have this, let's have that, you know? But I think that's what makes it fun and, oh, and gratifying that people have- And you do have to write one a year. I mean, I think I think your readers expect one a year for sure. What well, now think? it's like, I actually, it's like a tradition. Yeah. I've done a thing now where when I went to these conferences, we couldn't do that many because of pandemic, just like you were saying, Margaret, which was so hard. But a lot of people want autographed books. And I noticed an author in the UK had on her website, which I thought was brilliant, and said, send me a self-addressed stamped envelope and I'll send you a book plate and a bookmark. And a book plate is like, a, I didn't know because I was new to the author world. It's like a little sticker and you can sign it. Your autograph, it, you know, Susie, you know, always believe Karen Shaler. And you can send it. I have these personalized, these bookmarks that I sign as well to make them collectible. And so then people can, uh, like for people that are watching, let me see, I think I had one. Oh, I do. Okay, so here's the book plate I created. And this is the first year I've done this. So it's like a little book plate. It has my Always name. Always believe Karen Shaler. Yeah. Always believe. No, no, I would put your name up there, Margaret, if right. it was you. And then here is my bookmark. And my bookmark shows um, the book on the front and it has my social media. And then it has my other books on the back with my yeah. photo. And that way, if you want other books, actually Harper Collins kind of put me onto this when I had them. Now I do it myself. And so I just get an envelope and they send me self-address and I send them and I send them off, you know, but that's kind of a way to connect with the readers. And so now people are also writing me letters when they're sending it saying how it's a tradition, how they look forward nice. to the book every year. People Great. started in July. Last year, my book was up for sale in July. And this year it was, it was not, not even close. Um, and people are like, is it coming? Where is it? You know, they, they seem kind of in a panic about it. And I was in a panic because I was in the middle of changing the whole thing. Yeah. But I do feel a responsibility because it's Christmas. I think if nice. it was a summer romance, I could just say, ah, but it's now it's become a tradition. Yeah. You know, people and wanna, so, also people want to feel good story and it gets you in the mood. I mean, we're in, we're in November. I just read the book and Christmas is the next month, but it gets you in the holiday yes. mood. and It's a happy story. 
Exactly. Uh, and you know, remember my Christmas camp came out in July because Hallmark has a Christmas in July. And that's yeah. a thing even around the world because that's yeah. your halfway point. There are people that watch Christmas movies all year long for the right. joy. You know, I think that's what's so much, so much fun, but I feel very blessed. While it was one of the hardest years, I feel really blessed that I love writing movies when I I'm smiling when I'm writing the screenplay, even if I am under deadline or even if it's four in the morning, I, I'm so happy to me. It's the, it's the perfect blend of what I do. I see it. I hear it. I think of the sets because I've been all over the 68 countries. I think of where it could be set. You know, I see it so clearly and I love the characters and I laugh, I cry. I mean, I'm just so into it. A book. But how did you, how do you know how to structure struggle. a movie script? Oh, well, that was Google. I mean, that's what I did originally. I Googled, yeah. there's a million scripts online. Right. There's, there's books, you know, there's so many books like save the cat. And I'm trying to think of what's the one I have. It's like old school and it tells you how, but the best thing you can do is read scripts. It used to be yeah. harder when you started off and you can find your favorite movies and it's really cool to watch and see there's some, you know, point A, B, C, D structure that everyone needs to do. I taught myself online, everything I've done. Remember when I told you about the travel show, I had to start shooting my own video. I Googled, I learned to shoot. Oh, this, oh, that. Oh, here's a tripod. Actually, and then you didn't even finish that story because you said you're with ABC and then you said you want to do your yeah, own thing, but then I don't I did. know what So happened. now that's what I do now. And so now I own my own content okay. and that's what I started doing where I put together these minute and a half it's travel therapy trips with an S trips.com is my website. I actually relaunched it in February of this year on Valentine's day. Cause I said, my love of travel, it's the day I, I put it back out in the world. And I was actually in Harbor Island in the Bahamas where I spent several weeks. What I was doing prior to the pandemic, I pick a place in the world. And if I have to write a book or a movie, I want to be immersed in a different culture and try to give myself that quote, travel therapy. And I went to Portugal one year, a tiny little place you'd never heard of. I went to Spain on the coast of Blanca, also a tiny place you've never heard of. Little villages, Where do these air you know? though? Where do these air? Um, they, well, these, uh, those, those were movies that I wrote. I wasn't, I was doing social media for travel therapy, but when my travel therapy um, trips, they aired during, they aired everywhere. They aired in the airports um, and when it was clear TV. So for five or six, seven years, you had them on, on at the airports. But my big home, um, PIX11 was in New York, but my big home was ABC and they would air in local New York during Good Morning America weekend, live with Kelly and, um, and well, it was Kelly and before Ryan, it was Kelly and Michael, you know, it's different people, but Kelly and Ryan and Rachel Ray. Okay. And so they would air. And then what I would do is I would have my little time that I would get and it would be a minute and a half. And then it would be, you know, some of times I do longer content and it would be, it was on AOL and some, it was for a while we had, I had Amazon prime, you know, where people could get them on Amazon prime. And to be honest, I, I just was, I think I've done 185 TV episodes you know, and granted they're the shorter and everything was moving full speed ahead for even more partners and doing different things and talking to different people. And then all of a sudden the pandemic hit and that changed everything for all of us, right? I had a movie about to go and the pandemic hit. Um, I had a publishing deal with Harper Collins, but when the pandemic hit, I had to make the decision. I was switching publishers in the process and I had to make the decision of going out on my own, which I thought would be a lot easier than it was, you know, to self-publish. Yeah, that well, I mean, why hard. would you self-publish if you're with a traditional publisher? Well, I was with, I was switching from HarperCollins to Grand Central and there was a lot going on and then the pandemic. And so then it was like, it wasn't going to happen. You know, as my book was actually being sold um, by the publisher for a pre-sale and then legal, you know, there was my lawyer, their lawyers and a bunch of stuff happened. And because the pandemic and a lot of other things, it just said, we can't do it. You know, there was distribution problems. And so everybody was having issues or pushing books a year. And I was so passionate, exactly what you talked about, Margaret. I go, but my people need a book. I can't, during a pandemic, right. I can't not have a book this year. And plus you, and plus and you it, have an audience that's waiting for it. Yeah, and it was written. It was already written. So I thought, okay, I have to get a cover artist, have to get, you know, somebody to edit it, a copy editor. I didn't understand what typesetting, I didn't, you know, they're all, oh, there's so much more involved. And then distribution, trying to figure out how to be in bookstores. And it's been a journey. You know, right. I have such appreciation. So my goal is to be a hybrid. You're with the traditional publisher, right? No, it's, well, it's hybrid. Well, aspects of it are hybrid because. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But they're like, also I wanted control because my husband's an excellent designer and I wanted oh, him to nice. do, I wanted him to do this a typesetting and the cover. And I couldn't go to some publisher and be like, Hi, thanks for the deal. Oh, by the way, I want my husband to do everything because he is a, he is a complete pro and right. 
And also the public, the, um, the printer that they use is excellent and they're local. They're in the suburbs. They're not oh, in nice. China. So yeah. that the book is very good quality. So I wanted control over the quality. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I went with, um, after research and I went with Ingram spark, um, and they have a pro program where they invite some best selling authors in. And so I was very lucky to be invited into that program and the quality is amazing. I mean, you saw the quality. Oh, you haven't got the actual book yet. You'll see. And I, I'd love to know what your husband thinks too, because okay. I picked um, the same font because I had two books out or two books and a novella out with Harper Collins. And I had been part of that creation of which do we do caps for my name? Do we not, you know, those things that end up being important. And so I kept the same idea. So when you put all my books up, together they all it's not like these wackadoodle covers and you know right. there's all a theme yeah and i think that's so important i've had people oh margaret it's it's made me cry i think it was during the pandemic it was coming out um i mean it was um not coming out we're still still deal with the pandemic but i mean it was right after um it's 2001 so coming out of 2020 and so people had my book and somebody put it on social in January that um, they had framed, they had blown up and framed my book cover That's nice. because it had spoke to them that much. And it, they, all of mine are places to go. Like one is in walk inside a door. One is a gazebo, a real gazebo in Leavenworth, Washington by where at the Christmas town I would go to when I was little. And, you know, so it's all these like magical places with twinkle lights. And, and so I do feel such a huge responsibility and I have, I, and, and I, it's amazing. If anyone loves the royal, I wrote the Christmas Prince, of course, and then I wrote a royal Christmas fairy tale last year, which is also about a journalist. It's actually funny as everything because she thinks she's going to like like a journalist. She thinks she's going to uh, she loses her job and she's like she has no money, so she takes a freelance assignment. She's hard news. I obviously write what you know, yeah. and she has to do this feature story on some lifestyle feature story in some family in Europe, but she needs the money and. You know, it's her old boss gets her the gig. So she goes and it turns out it's a royal family. They wanted it all hush hush. But there's another twist. It's not just that. They're not really wanting her to do a story about them. They want to hire her to write a fairy tale for the young princess that mm -hmm. they feel is forgetting by using all their Christmas traditions so she can always keep those family traditions going forever in this fairy tale. So they've got this journalist, hard news journalist that they want to write this fluff piece. And she, so, so they want her to do all the Christmas stuff, you know, their traditional royal right. Christmas stuff. So it's really kind of funny. But that said, I have my first non-Christmas story coming out. I have a movie, but it won't come out, you know, before that. So it's one of those anthologies where Terry Wilson, who writes a ton of same type of lane as me, these amazing novels. She has ones that have been on the Hallmark Channel. I mentioned Ryan Pavey. He's in some of her movies, the Darcy movies where, you know, yes, Mr. Darcy. Right. So she writes all these really fun, she's really smart. They love, Hollywood loves adapting her work. And she got all of these author, best-selling authors together. I was invited into the club, which nice. really made me feel good. Yeah. And I think it's 24 of us authors. We're all writing a short royal story. And it's right now it's on sale, 99 cents. Because wow. we're basically just doing it as all of us as a thank you to everyone. Nice. And to get it out there in the world. It'll come out in the spring. And I'm working on mine. And so it, it'll be around for those of you that are authors, they're short stories. So it's like 10 to 15,000 words. But I think it ends up being less than four cents a story if you break wow. it down, if it's 99 yeah. cents. So I tell everybody it's called Royal, just Royal. And it's like these little tidbits. And Terry Wilson is T-E-R-I Wilson or my website's karenshaler.com. It's on there too. But yeah. and what, what I think a movie producer should pick it up, right? A scout because hello, yeah. 24 potential royal stories. And you know how popular right. those Christmas stories are. They and they, they also like content that people can refresh. Like here we have this, then we have this, right. then we have this. Yeah, exactly. So when are we going to see your movie, Miss Margaret? I have to, I, I wrote the first draft of a script. So, yes. and I didn't keep rewriting because I'm thinking, gosh, I'm spending so much time on the second Good. novel. So, and also and I'm in the WGA and I want to be paid for my writing. I, Cause I hear these exactly. stories about other people and they're not being paid. Like they do all this writing, rewriting, re and I, I even, I met a couple of people and their stuff was not necessarily developed and they spent like thousands of hours. Mm -hmm. Well, and yeah. I did talk to, I did talk to an A-list, right? I don't want to say who it is, but I did talk to an A-lister. And they asked me, they said, you know, what are you doing? I said, okay, I wrote one draft and I don't want to write for free. Okay. Cause I'm, I've been writing for free on yeah. fiction. So, 
Well, anyway. and I think that's we talk about it in the class, you guys. It's a little different with a novel that you have to put out there and you have an editor. Right. But in a screenplay, make it as good as you can. You don't want to do 10 drafts. They're going to change it, guys. Right, exactly. This isn't like your book where it is going to be what you write. So right. I say get a story out there. You still want to be proud and put your best foot forward. But this is the right. one to obsess about. If you're spending exactly. more, then just get it out there and maybe put it away and then find a way to tighten it, you know, and find different things that yeah. you can do. But we talk about spec scripts gold. I mean, it's, yeah. it's my ticket in. It's how I sold my first movie. Nobody's going to hire me, even if you have the best idea. You need to have to show you can write it. Right. And, I, and I, I, we had a, in one of our classes, right, Margaret, we had a great uh, novelist. But she's like, well, I have a novel. And my agent says I have to write a screenplay. But can't they see in my novel that I'm a writer? And it's like, oh, heck no. It's very you different didn't write writing. a script. Very yeah. different writing. And I'm, and, I'm yeah. really good at dialogue. And you also have to be good at dialogue because that's all it is. Absolutely. Same thing. And you probably saw a lot in my novel because people sometimes say, I feel like I'm reading a, or right. I feel like I'm watching a movie. And to me, that's the biggest compliment. There's a lot of dialogue. Yeah. But wait, but yeah. the thing in your, in your book, but the thing is um, what I want to know is now that you're doing all this Christmas stuff and you have extreme success in Hollywood and no, I, no take that. No, I, I do not have extreme. I have, I've dabbled a toe. I don't know if anyone has extreme. Look, you were the first Christmas, but you were the first Christmas movie on Netflix. That's huge. And everybody loves it. Please everybody go and look up a Christmas Prince and you'll see what I'm talking about. But and then you have this Audible um, original, which is extremely so hard to achieve. Very excited. Okay. But when you look back and you look back at when you were a reporter, does it seem like a different person? Your life as a mm. reporter? Oh, well, the, my life was different. I think me as a person, I've always been exactly me. You know, like I say, whether I'm interviewing the president, which okay. I've done, or if I'm interviewing the janitor, but my life is a, a 180. I mean, I'd wake up, the difference is I'd wake up every day as a reporter and it was my job to find the worst story that had happened that night overnight. What's the absolute worst thing that has happened that people need to know about, that they literally need to know for their safety or yeah. w whatever it might be. And now I wake up every day looking for the most positive, inspiring story that I can help make somebody's day a little better, or yeah. if they're alone, give them some comfort. So my mindset of waking up it, for career-wise is completely different and it's healthy. And I'm grateful. I still work every day on, you know, it's a good way to wrap up, right? I work every day on work-life balance. We all do. And, but, but I did this tonight, even though there's a million things going on in, in your life as well. But I, this is such a joy to share and to talk to you and to talk to everybody. And if there's one thing I said, and all of the things I said that can give someone hope, excuse me, hope, losing my voice, hope or inspiration, or just be like, okay, that was fun to listen. I didn't know what something, then, then I've done, then I'm happy. You know, there's so many things in our own lives we can't control and coming from a type A control freak, it sure feels good to help others and to be able to share. And you guys are like my community now, you know, this is, this is my connection. I'm not traveling right now to all the different mm. places. So Margaret, thank you for what you always do with your live streams and your podcasts. And you're, you're so good at all of that. And I encourage anyone that if, in the, if they're in the Writers Guild that sees this or beyond, I mean, the, I missed your class and I need to take it. But Margaret, the Writers Guild. Oh, the webinar is, thing? Yes. You know, they oh, yeah. brought Maybe on. I might do it. I have, to, I have to, like, they're the ones that decide. They're the one. Because I pitched the idea originally. Yeah. And then they asked me to come back. So we'll see if they ask me to that's come back. Huge. In the I yeah. mean, that's huge. You have the best writers, literally not to brag, but I think in the world, yeah. I mean, Steven Spielberg's in our writers guild, Aaron Sorkin's in our writers guild. We got, we got all the, we got everybody, you know? And so they ask you to run that. That's amazing. And you do so well, much. Yeah, first, I pitched, yeah, first and... I pitched the idea and they're like, okay. And they, they had to interview me on the phone to see yeah, what my story was, but yeah, then they, yeah, they invite me. So I think it's going to happen again in the spring. So. Oh yeah. It sounded like it. It sounded like they wanted you back for sure. I mean, yeah. I think that's, that's huge. And you're providing content, but you also provide education. You know, right. that's what I'm trying to do a little bit. Like I joke about TikTok, but I really went on not to say buy my book. I mean, that's stupid and ridiculous, you know, all at the same time, but I'm saying, yes, I'm talking a lot about, I have a book, I have audible. And I, right now it sounds promotional because everything's out. So I'm announcing it, but I'm saying I have this so here's how I can help you. I've done this. Do you want to know about audio? I've done this. You don't want to know about screenwriting? Right. What can I answer? You know what I it's mean? Good. That's why I'm there. And you should do a, a you should do a Reddit. Platform. You should do a Reddit ask me anything. I don't even know what that is. Reddit? Okay, you know what Reddit is. Well, I know is, what right? Reddit is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's AMA, ask me anything. And you can go on there, but you really have to answer whatever questions they have. Yes. You should do well, that. I do. I do I'm, not I'm, say this. Yeah. 
Oh, I was just saying, I did a Facebook Live um, with Thrift Books last year. And I said, ask questions. We were trying to do it live and we were powering through. Like, kind of like you said, how do you stay focused? Like really, you know, they were just going as fast as we could and for two hours to get as many questions in live. But I said, I promise if I didn't get to you, I'll answer them. And I think there were 6,500 questions. Wow. But if you make a promise, I did it. You know, oh it took me a God. week, you know, but I jump in and answer. And I did not, I don't have an assistant that's answering for me. Uh, I don't know how well, Reddit, do you should that. do Look into Reddit. Okay, ask me anything. You. Say, say, hi, I'm Karen Shaler. Yeah. I am the, I am the writer of a Christmas Prince and Christmas writer. Ask me anything and see what, you know, see what happens. Pitch their That'd pitch be the fun. idea to, it's the idea it's to them. I talked to somebody today that said on TikTok, they, there's a thing called stitch where I guess they said, they said I should do that. They said, I should say, I wrote a Christmas Prince. What's your favorite scene stitch me or ask me about it and then you're asking them and then they all come on and ask you questions but it's like live like they'll be in a video That's I know nice. it's crazy it's crazy but I like that I like reddit and I like the idea of that and yeah. I'm gonna do that probably after the new year so I can actually answer everybody's questions <laughs> right right no you should do that okay I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop uh stop the thing now okay so I'm stopping okay, we gotta say I goodbye to anybody that was crazy enough to join us for our when I say crazy enough I just mean if you were listening live, because uh, I put it on Facebook without even announcing it, it was a little surprise for everybody. That's so cool. thank you. Okay, wait, hold on. I'm stopping the event, but hold on. Okay, right now I'm stopping. I'm stopping.